Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are you? What a glorious day we have here in Rochester, New York, right? Um, all right. Um, well, just hello, everyone. It's so great to see so many familiar faces today, so many new faces. Welcome to the University of Rochester FSHD 360 event. Um, it's a wonderful educational conference that we host uh, around the country. Um, and for those of you that don't know me, I'm Beth Johnston. I'm the Chief Community Engagement Officer here at the FSHD Society. Uh, my family is also personally affected by FSHD. Um, so it's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I would really like to thank, and if I would love to give a round of applause to the University of Rochester team for hosting us today. So thank you guys so much. And Dr. Robbie Tawil and his amazing clinical research team, you guys are the best. So thank you so much for being here and hosting us. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping items. Um, if you're not virtual at home, you guys know where your restrooms are, but if you're here, um, the restrooms are right around out the door to the left. They're literally right around the corner to the left. So the restrooms are right there. Um, the emergency exit is to the right down the hall um, at the end of the hall. If God forbid anything should happen, that's the way we go in an emergency. Um, you guys might see these paddles on your um, table. Um, they're not for fanning yourselves, although if you do get hot, go ahead and fan yourself. <laughs> these are for folks, if you would like to ask a question and you're unable to raise your hand, um, we will use these for Q&A. So keep these handy for our Q&A sessions. Um, and of course, you guys saw all the snacks and beverages and yumminess um, on the table out here. We'll clear that off in a little while and lunch will be provided um, midday as well. So that's all the housekeeping I have. Um, but before we get started, I'd like to thank our generous sponsors of these FSHD 360 conference programs, um, Avidity Biosciences and Fulcrum Therapeutics. And I'd like to welcome in the back here, Ms. Marie Helen Jovan. Did I say it properly? Okay. Um, from Fulcrum Therapeutics is with us here today. So um, she's happy to ask, answer any questions that you guys might have. Um, and Thank you for being with us today, Marie Helen. Sure it is. It's my, my great honor to be with you. Um, for those of you that don't know us, the FSHD Society is the world's largest research focused patient advocacy or organization that's focused solely on FSHD. Um, we've got 30, over 30 volunteer led chapters across the country um, in the US. And now we have three in Canada, I'm so proud to say. Um, and we are part of a 20 plus country world FSHD Alliance. Our mission is to find treatments and a cure for FSHD while empowering you, our families. Um, we co-host these and so many other educational and social events to give you, our families, an arsenal of knowledge so that you can be your own best advocate uh, when it comes to your care and empower you to better understand the research that's happening and the role that you play in accelerating therapy development. Um, so honestly, why are we here today? Why are we here? Where's my mouse? Um, just wanna get my slide ready here, okay. So why are we here today at the University of Rochester? Well, because this university is a founding member of the International FSHD Clinical Trial Research Network, or CTRN, as you will hear it referred to throughout the day. Um, the CTRN is comprised of leading FSHD research centers in North America and in Europe. And they adhere to uniform standards and training for assessing patients and for sharing data. The CTRN co-directors are Dr. Robbie Tawil, here at the University of Rochester and Dr. Jeffrey Statland at the University of Kansas. And we even have a special guest representative from the University of Kansas here to we'll hear from later. These CTRN sites, in addition to being academic research and clinical study centers, are also care centers that specialize in care for FSHD patients. So by being here today or being online here today, you are connecting with an outstanding care team that clearly understands FSHD, world-leading researchers that we are blessed to have in the field and clinical studies and trials of FSHD therapies. So it's really important that you understand why Rochester is so, so important to all of us. Great. All right, so the society's role in all of this is really just to advance a scientific understanding of research through funding to support clinical research success 
through partnerships with both these clinics and industry and representing the patient voice and improve their participation in that. And then to educate, empower the community through our chapter program, our walk and roll fundraising program, FSHD university webinars that are online, and the, of course, these 360 conferences, um, as well as our online communities. And I'm not sure that everyone is aware of how many wonderful online communities we have that honestly, COVID, that's the one thing COVID brought us that was good, is these communities now um, gather um, monthly or more than that, um, and throughout the world, um, throughout the country and throughout the world. So it's really great. We call them the gathering places. And um, I would encourage you to go online to our website and just check out, I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of the gathering places, uh, but those are our, our online communities for support and, and um, education. And of course, our FSHD radio podcast hosted by the infamous and wonderful Tim Hollenbeck. He's just a good guy. Um, so for our agenda today, first, we're going to hear from Dr. Robbie Tawil on FSHD disease overview. We have a recorded talk from Dr. Natalie Katz, who will speak about FSHD in children. Um, hot topic right now. Um, Shannon Kilburn is in the back of the room from the New York State Department of Public Health and is going to discuss uh, FSHD research and insights from MD Starnet, which was news to me. I'd never heard of this before. It's really cool. It's a CDC funded research program that collects health information on those living with muscular dystrophy. And Shannon's going to tell us more about that program. Great. Um, Dr. Johanna Hamel, right there she is. Um, she is going to tell us uh, about the current FSHD clinical trials that are happening. We'll take a quick 15 minute break. And then the entire care team here at the University of Rochester um, will take your questions. We'll have a little um, panel uh, with the care team here. Then we will take another 15 minute break, it looks like. Um, oh no, after that, um, we're gonna have a 45 minute lunch break around 12.30 or so. And then Dr. Jamshid Arjamand, our chief science officer at the FSHD Society will speak about trial readiness for FSHD and all the moving parts involved to ensure success of trials. Um, Dr. Tawil, Leanne Lewis, uh, Jordan Braunchager will talk about getting enrolled in clinical trials and review um, some frequently asked questions about the process. We'll take another quick break after that. Um, and then we have a guest today, as I mentioned, from the University of Kansas, uh, Michaela Walker, who's gonna speak to us today about the MOVE and MOVE Plus studies. Um, then we'll hear from a couple of uh, patient advocates here, um, Sandra Bird and Michael Gottlieb. Um, and then what are we going to do after that? And then I'm going to update you on our chapter program and how important an active FSHD community is to the success of therapy development and approvals. And then we'll have some time to socialize at the end of the day. So take a deep breath. It's going to be a long, fun, interesting, and educational day. But so without further ado, let's get to it. I'd like to introduce Dr. Rabi Tawil, the co-director of the MDA Neuromuscular Disease Clinic here at the University of Rochester. You'll take care. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Beth, um, and welcome everybody. And it, it's nice to be able, again, to have a, an in-person uh, meeting. And a lot has changed since the last time we uh, we came together and I would like to talk about some of that. So, I and I wanted to go through quickly a little bit about where we started and where we are now. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of exciting things going on. In, in the research and, and clinical trials in FSHD, uh, as you'll hear from other people as well. So, um, so I want to talk about the Resolve FSHD, which is a, a, a grant that uh, that we obtained back in 2016. Uh, myself and, and Dr. Jeff Statlin at the University uh, Kansas University Medical Center, and. The reason, the purpose of, of this study is to uh, get uh, the the community ready for um, uh, for uh, drug development 
and um, at clinical trials. So in 2010, uh, the, the definitive, there was a definitive publication about the actual uh, cause of FSHD. At that time, Jeff Satland was a fellow at the University of Rochester. And I told him that we need to get ready for clinical trials. Um, it was actually difficult to start because there was no funding of such uh, observational studies that are really critical for, um, for uh, the future clinical trials that were you know, coming. Um, because the, the NIH actually does not fund any observational studies. Uh, so what we did is obtain studies from, obtain funding from um, private donors, as well as from um, the FSA Society uh, and, 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 and the MDA. Um, and we did a few small trials that were not big enough to, to make a difference, but were kind of introductory uh, uh, studies that, that then allowed us in 20. 15 to apply to the NIH with a new program that actually funded an observational study. And that's where we started to uh, the, start to put together the, um, the uh, Resolve FSHD study, which then included um, eight sites in the United States. Um, and then it, it mushroomed into another uh, three sites in Europe. Uh, and has gotten bigger ever since. But this was a really essential study uh, for the, the, the moving from, um, from research into uh, 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 drug trials. <clears throat> so why is, why is an observational study important? in any disease that we're, we're studying. Uh, it is really important because we need to know what happens to people over time. What is, how fast is the progression of the disease? All of that is very important in, in trying to figure out how many patients we need for a clinical trial and how long the clinical trial is going to be or has, has to be um, to, uh, to, to actually get good clinical data about uh, um, any intervention that we do. And so initially we started with 160 patients that, that was in our, in our NIH application. We then added the sites in Europe and we were aiming for 240 patients to be followed. Um, and again, as Beth uh, um, talked about, the FMCH CTRN was formed, KUMC was a central coordinator for the projects in the central IRB. Our institution was doing the data acquisition and management and storage of all of the biological resources that were, um, that were uh, the, the result of the study that we did. <clears throat> So again, why is a trial readiness critical? Again, as I mentioned, uh, that determines how long the study has to has to be uh, to to actually detect change over time. Uh, the other important aspect is that you want to do the appropriate test to uh, uh, to measure changes, and, and there are many different ways of testing strength in in any neuromuscular disease, uh, but it's, it's, it's important to know how it's done in FSH in particular, and what's the most um, reliable measurement that we can use uh, to, to measure change over time. And again, I mean, one of, there are two aspects to that. One is that, you know, we can get just data, but they did, data is not in, uh, of, of patients and we can give you numbers, and that's not not enough for the FDA to get an approval of a drug. You have to have measurements that are clinically relevant to a patient. Uh, so, um, so it's really kind of uh, uh, assessing different um, aspects of daily life and what people do and how they use their muscles 
And so we need to show changes in function rather than just numbers uh, as far as strength of uh, individual muscles. Uh, the other thing is the, the other important aspect is to try to develop what we call biomarkers. And these are um, clinical tests, it can be a muscle biopsy, they can be a number of things that can potentially detect change in patients in a clinical trial before we see that clinically. And so the biomarkers are important, uh, again, for the drug companies to see that, you know, okay, we, we've not gone through the whole study, but we can already see changes in the biomarkers that um, suggest that there's an improvement or there's no improvement uh, in, the, in the patients. Again, uh, examples of biomarkers are circulating biomarkers like blood tests that measure certain uh, aspects of, of what, what you have circulating in your blood. Uh, that's again detected before you see it, you see it in clinical measures of strength. Other my, biomarkers of change in muscle that may predict slowing of progression includes MRI, which is very important. Uh, measurements of changes in muscle. Uh, by doing muscle biopsies or doing MRIs of the muscles or um, new technology like electrical impedance myography. Again, these are all tools that, that help uh, um, the, the um, um, drug companies assess uh, whether they're on the right track for in, in the treatment of patients. Um, so the other part of the FSHCCDRN are studies that we did separately uh, from the RESOLVE study to look at biomarkers. And this is a, a collaboration between here, KUMC and the University of Washington, with Dr. Stephen Tapscott being the, um, um, <coughs> the primary uh, uh, investigator. And we looked at MRI changes over time. Uh, can MRI uh, allow us to select the sites that we need to do biopsies on to see if there's change over time? Um, and what other biomarkers that uh, potentially in blood that we can see that, that may be helpful in, in assessing the, um, the response to treatment in a clinical trial. And again, the CTRN has been uh, has evolved from eight US sites um, to 26 sites at the present time. Um, uh, most of them are in, in the U.S. and in Canada, and there's an additional um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, sites in, in Europe, and we also have sites overseas and in, in that are not it, that are in process of, of um, um, joining the CPRN. One is in, in Brazil. Uh, one in uh, Australia and one in New Zealand and one in India. Um, all of those sites, and, and the number of sites that we have in the CPR is really important because of what's going on with uh, uh, clinical trials and FSHD and what, what we expect to see in the next couple of years, which is uh, um, a tremendous increase in the number of trials. You need to have more sites that are ready for clinical trials to be able to for the companies to be able to run their studies and to get results. Um, and so what we've achieved so far is that we've established a network of sites ready for clinical trials, rigorously trained by um, um, our um, clinical evaluators. And Kate Eichinger in, in principle uh, actually trained all, all of the invest all of the uh, um, uh, physical therapists at, at the other sites. Uh, appropriate uh, testing equipment at all the sites at CPRN. Uh, is all study has shared with pharma and uh, and and um, um, and also uh, academic investigators uh, data from from CPRN. Um, uh, and this is really important. Again, the whole purpose was to get that data to spread it out, to allow the companies to work on their clinical trials. Um, we also have collected a lot of biological samples, uh, 
with pharma and academic research and we've shared met much of those and that's going to help develop the biomarkers in the future studies. We are really at a turning point here. Uh, the natural history, uh, from the natural history, there's enough observational data that you can use in planning clinical trials. The biomarkers, uh, MRI has become an important aspect, an important biomarker in FSHD. There's still work to be done on tissue biomarkers um, and still in flux further testing from blood biomarkers. And all of those are being actively looked at right now. Um, the clinical trials have taken off. Um, we currently have one clinical trial, uh, the REACH trial um, um, that uh, has started recently. There are three other, there are two other trials that are going to start in the next month. And from the prediction of one of the companies that's looking at the future of, of research in FSHD as far as drug uh, trials, there are 10 different approaches to FSHD that are actively being worked on um, in, uh, currently. And they, there's an expectation that in the next two years, many of those will go to the trial. Um, it, it, yeah, uh, so it, again, I, I think we are at, at a really kind of a turn, very, very important turning point in uh, research and um, drug trials in FSAT. Things are going to be moving very quickly, and uh, we've been um, very um, I think we're all excited about what's coming up next. And I, I know it's been a long time coming for patients to have FSH longer than expected, but we are there. And I'm very hopeful that we're going to have clinical trials that are going to be effective in the next few years. So I'd like to acknowledge um, all of my colleagues here. Kate Eichinger, uh, Leon Lewis, um, Don Henderson, who runs our lab, as well as Je uh, Janet Sadden, uh, and Nicole White, who's our uh, her physical therapist, and Kansas City, of course, who can have worked without them, especially Michaela Walker, who's on top of everything happening in CPR and, and our other collaborators. Um, so I'll stop here and take some questions. Well, um, yeah. Electrical impedance myopathy, what is that? Electrical impedance myography, it's a way of testing. It's it's a new uh, instrument. It, you basically, it, it, um, it sends a, a very small electrical impulse into the muscle and measures the response of the muscle. And that gives you an idea about the composition of the muscle. Okay. This has not been... Uh, completely qualified yet as, as an outcome measure, but this is something that we looked at as a new new way of... I mean, you did something to me like that with a, a little... A, a, yeah, you did, though. You came in and yeah. with a little paddle and... Yes, that's it. That's what it was? Yeah, that's what it was, yeah. Okay. I was, I was unsure, but yeah, thank you. Mr. Wallace has been very helpful in... in <laughs> Involvement in the in, in our uh, observation studies. Anybody else? Any questions from? Um... Okay. Okay. So. Um... The next is going to be Natalie Katz, who's. Uh, was a fellow at the University of Rochester, but she's going to be elsewhere next year and in the next couple, a couple of months. Natalie is a pediatric and neuromuscular specialist. And, um, you know, we've heard the, um, a lot from the patient advocacy groups and, and, and patients themselves about the lack of, of research on early onset FSHD. Um, and, uh, and, and I think we're 
very interested in, in getting that going, learning about the natural history of, of kids with FSHD and um, uh, and again, preparing for clinical trials in, in pediatric population. So we'll switch on to now. This is a report of graduates can be here. Hi everyone, welcome to Rochester. My name's Natalie, for those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the pediatric neuromuscular specialists here at the U of R. I'm so sorry that I couldn't be there with you today, but I appreciate you letting me take a few moments just to provide you with some updates and future directions on where the field of pediatric FSHD is headed. So just a brief outline of my talk today, I just wanna update you on a couple of studies that are ongoing and one recently published study looking at MRI in children with FSHD. And then really what does this mean um, for the kids who have FSHD? So the first study I wanted to provide you with an update on is using data that was analyzed as part of the FSHD registry. For those of you who aren't familiar with the registry here at the University of Rochester, we house the data that's collected as a part of this annual survey. Individuals and families can opt in to participate in the registry. We'll send you a survey annually where you fill out information about your health, any major updates, um, and then we collect this information and are able to use it to see if we can learn anything about how things are progressing in FSHD. Um, and you're able to participate in the registry and be involved in other studies because um, this is a survey that you fill out annually and doesn't um, have any other obligations beyond just providing us with your information. So me being a pediatric neurologist by training, I was really interested in looking at the data from the registry and individuals who reported being diagnosed with FSHD during their pediatric years. And so these numbers here are all of the individuals that we have in the database who reported being diagnosed at or before age 18. As of March of this year, there were about 650 individuals in total in the registry who were diagnosed with FSHD type one. And when we censor that down to look at individuals who were diagnosed um, at or before age 18, there were a total of 166 individuals in the registry who reported um, pediatric diagnosis of FSHD, and about half of them were males and half of them were females. When we look at the age at which they reported being diagnosed, overall individuals were diagnosed around age 14 on average. Males were a little bit older, reporting an average age of diagnosis around 15 years of age and females slightly younger at 12 and a half years of age. But where things really start to get interesting is when we look at um, individuals who were diagnosed very early on in life. So individuals who report a diagnosis at or before 10 years of age. So individuals who have very early onset of symptoms um, in that first decade of life. And when we compare that to individuals who were diagnosed in the second decade of life. So in the teenage years. Um, and what we see is that there is a significantly higher percentage of females compared to males in this under 10 age group. And um, similarly, when we look at the genetics and look at the size of the D4Z4 repeats, we see that there's a higher proportion of these D4Z4 repeats in the one to three range in the females as compared to the males. And when we run the numbers and put them through statistical software, this becomes statistically significant. And so the rest of the analysis is ongoing to see what does this all mean? Is there anything else that we can garner from this registry information to help us understand why this might be the case? Are, are there any additional risk factors that might um, give us some clues about how the disease is progressing or why these um, individuals sorted out this way? And so that analysis is currently ongoing, and we're hoping to publish those results in the next few months. So stay tuned for that. 
The second update that I wanted to just quickly provide you with is about pediatric enrollment in the currently ongoing MOVE FSHD um, study, which you'll hear much more about later on today. Um, but as of right now, we have 14 pediatric subjects who are enrolled with two more who are coming in for their first visit later on this month. Three of these um, children have completed their second visit already, and the other 11 will be returning very soon to complete their second visit. And these subjects are enrolled at 15 different sites around the United States, um, three of which are in Canada. So we're very excited to have our partners to the north participating in this study. And then finally, I just wanted to um, provide you with a quick update on a recently published study, not by our group, but by some of our collaborators in Australia, Dr. Ian Woodcock and Kate Duvall um, and their team recently published this manuscript looking at MRI in children with FSHD and seeing how that correlates with some of these um, functional motor strength assessments, all those funny things that we have you do in the clinic to see how strong you are. Um, and so I'll just give you a little bit of background on this um, manuscript. So they had 11 participants ranging in age from seven to 15 years old at the time that they completed their MRI, six males, five females. In this particular study, they just all happened to have FSHD type one, but individuals with FSHD type two were not necessarily excluded from the study. And importantly for me, when I'm thinking about doing MRIs for children, um, they were able to complete all of these MRIs without the need for any sedation or anesthesia. Um, so in this study, they did what we call whole body imaging. And when we say whole body imaging, we're really looking at pictures from the neck all the way down to the toes. So this includes things like the shoulders, the arms, the abdomen, trunk, back muscles, the hips, the legs. So really looking at all of the muscles kind of from, from neck to toes. And they did a variety of different, what we call functional outcome measures. So these are all those strength testing things that we have you do in the clinic, all the things where we have you walk and we time you and do different things and we um, are constantly writing numbers down on pieces of paper. Um, and so these are just a variety of the different assessments that they included in this paper. I'll not go into the specifics of these, but just wanted to let you know that they looked at a variety of things, many of which are the similar are similar things that we are looking at here in our clinic. Um, and so to jump right into the results, I just wanted to provide you with a little bit of background on what an MRI looks like um, in someone who is completing one of these whole body MRIs. And so this picture here is from an adult. Um, and if you use your imagination, you can picture this person laying down on their back and their feet are coming out of the screen towards you. So kind of picture that in your mind. Um, when we look at these images, the, the pictures are actually in reverse. So this is actually the left leg over here, and this is actually the right leg on this side of the screen. This white dot here in the center is the leg bone, the humerus, and these dark gray blobs around it are the muscles in your leg. So these are the quadriceps muscles here in the front of the leg on the top of your thigh. And then these are the hamstring muscles here in the back of the leg. And this individual technically has FSHD type one, um, but has a relatively normal MRI. And so I just wanted you to have this picture in your mind so that when I show you this picture of another individual who also has FSHD type one, you can hopefully appreciate that the muscles in this individual look significantly different than, um, than the first photograph that I showed you. So again, this person is laying down on their back, their feet are coming out towards you. This is the left leg over here. This is the right leg over here. This is that leg bone, the humerus muscle here, or humerus here. And then you can see the muscles around it. And hopefully you can appreciate that these muscles look significantly different. Um, and when we see on this particular <coughs> filter, as I like to call them, um, all of this white signal um, to us, when we look at that on the MRI suggests that there has been fatty replacement of the muscle. So in this individual, he has or she has um, more advanced disease of the muscle and that has been replaced by fat. 
The other important thing to highlight here is that you can appreciate that there's quite a difference even between the left leg and the right leg in this individual. And as many of you know, things are not always even when it comes to FSHD. And so you can you can appreciate the differences in the signal both from one person to the next, but also from left to right um, as shown here. <clears throat> And so in the study by Dr. Woodcock, this is actually one of the images that was published on the children that were included in that study. And this is really exciting to me because this is one of the first times that we've ever been able to see MRI images published um, on children with FSHD. So laying on their back, feet coming out towards you. This is the left leg, this is the right leg, this is the humerus bone. And these are those quadriceps muscles here on the top of the leg and the hamstring muscles here in the back of the leg. And hopefully you can appreciate that again, this signal is a little bit different than that very first one that I showed you. Um, and these arrows are really pointing to a couple of these hamstring muscles in this child um, to show that there has been um, some fatty replacement of the muscle here in the child. So um, what they wanted to see in this study was, do these MRI pictures correlate with those things that we have done for so long traditionally in the clinic and all of those um, strength assessments that we ask you to do when you come and see us either for a study visit or in the clinic. Um, and so one of these is the FSHD COM or the Comprehensive Outcomes Measure. And when we score this, the higher the number, the um, more advanced the disease is. And so they've also developed a similar scoring paradigm for the MRI pictures when we score them and look at the different muscles, the higher the score means that there has been more, um, more advanced disease, more um, fatty replacement of those muscles. And so what Dr. Woodcock was able to show was that there is indeed a very good correlation between these MRI findings and these um, functional measures that we do here in the clinic. So over here on the y-axis is the FSHD COM outcome measure. Um, and the, the scores for that, again, higher numbers mean more advanced disease. And similar here on the x-axis is the MRI um, infil fatty infiltration score, again, with higher numbers representing more advanced disease, more fatty replacement of those muscles. And so this dotted line that goes through here is this correlation. And so each of these blue dots represents an individual patient. And so what they what you hope you can appreciate is that these blue dots fall relatively close to this line. And so this suggests that there's actually a very good correlation between what we're able to gain from reviewing these pictures and how that translates to what we're able to see in the clinic. And so this was very exciting because this is Again, one of the first studies that's ever been published looking at MRI and functional outcome measures in children with FSHD. Um, so it really can be done um, and shows good correlation, which is really exciting for us. This study was only a single time point, um, but Dr. Woodcock and his team have longitudinal studies that are ongoing right now, um, and so more to come from that. And we are actively working with Dr. Woodcock um, as we move into the future directions of what this means for our children here in the United States who have FSHD um, in combination with, in collaboration with Dr. Woodcock, um, Dr. Tuil, Dr. Statland, um, and others around the United States, we have really felt the need to um, develop a specific protocol for the children with FSHD as part of MOVE. And so um, over the next probably six to 12 months, we're going to be making a lot of movement towards developing a pediatric specific protocol um, as a part of the MOVE study, but it'll kind of help define the pediatric population and really give it its own um, its own entity. Um, and so it'll include many of the similar, many of the um, functional assessments that are already in, ongoing as part of MOVE. This includes the reachable workspace. And importantly, we are looking to expand access to MRIs for all of these children. So right now is a part of the general MOVE study. Children are not eligible for these MRIs, um, but we are working to expand this because we think this is a really unique opportunity to 
gain as much information as we can from the kiddos and from their families as much as they're willing to let us we're gonna we're gonna see what we can do um, and so there are some pilot studies that will be gearing up here over the next few months and then as we develop this um, specific protocol um, we're hoping to expand access to all of our move sites so that children can not only do the functional measurements but can also participate in the MRI studies um, and then there will be the possibility of an optional muscle biopsy that will be a site-by-site case-by-case basis so not everybody will be required to do that some sites may not even participate in that and so these are some of the things that are, are currently being discussed and worked on um, but this all is just a really exciting time for us in pediatric FSHD. There are um, a number of uh, pharmaceutical and startup companies, biotech companies who have expressed an interest not only in helping our adults with FSHD, but really see a unique um, opportunity with the children because we know from other neuromuscular disorders that the sooner we can provide treatment and intervention, the better the long-term outcomes. And I think people are starting to recognize that both in FSHD and in pediatric FSHD. So um, with that, I will let you all go. Again, I'm so sorry that I could not be there with you today, but please do not hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm always happy to respond to email, set up a phone call. Um, to answer those questions and you are surrounded by a wealth of information and individuals who can even answer some of those questions for you on site today. So um, thank you all for spending a few moments with me and I hope you enjoy the rest of your time. Bye. Bye Natalie. <laughs> she felt like she was here. <laughs>starts and so it depends on it depends the size of the of the deletion of, of that gene that's part of it that's true yeah. and it also depends on correlating genes and epigenetic factors so i just we're pursuing this language with infant onset or childhood onset but it's really a misnomer because everyone's born with the, the disease and we're we're hyper fixated on onset but it's not actually helping treatment. Everyone in this room, every adult who has FSH was a child with FSH. Right. And I, if I can add, my yeah. question is Michael, I'm, I'm an FSH patient, so I've worked in rare disease as well for many years. And the biggest problem is diagnosis. It's not when the doctor tells you you have FSHD. Yeah, right? I'm, his, I, I'm I, his wife and I worked in survey research for pharmas, yeah. doing patient research studies for almost 20 years. And if I were doing these studies, not in medicine, but as a, as a methodologist, I would have had to analyze the quality of the diagnosing physician and all the physicians who interacted with that patient to find out how accurate and what track records they had with diagnosis in order to ascertain whether or not these children actually had more aggressive symptomology as children or whether or not they just happened to interact with doctors we're not as good at diagnosis. Well, I think there's many aspects to that. I mean, one is, you know, I, I can give you examples of patients that I've seen that come, for example, with a foot drop on one side. Yeah. And this was a kind of teenage girl who plays volleyball. Yeah. And when I asked her to lift her arms up, she was able to, she worked around it, but she didn't realize that this was a problem. Right, because right. the rare disease patients define their normal is that's something right. that's not normal for the average person. I would around. love to see a study of, mm -hmm. like there was a comment made in one of the screens on we've done enough natural history, but we actually haven't done a study to find out from patients in retrospect 
what symptoms they had with the disease before diagnosis. Because actually, my experience is that patients have a lot of symptoms that they didn't express to doctors because it's, well, that's how my dad was. That's how my uncle was. That's how we just got it on and everyone's nodding. That's how we just got on in our family. Mom was slow. I was slow. That's just kind of how we were. So there are a lot of symptoms that just don't come to the fore. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's that's very accurate. But at the same time, I mean, we see adults um, you know, who have siblings who have FSH3 and they have the, the mutation, they're not showing any symptoms. So, well, so, I mean, we have the whole kind of spectrum. No, I mean, I have four kids. Yeah. They all have FSH. They all have totally different symptoms. They all have symptoms and they all are not progressing in any way that would be indicative of anything shown yeah. or discussed. But you know what to look for, too. So it's a completely different thing when you have a known family history versus someone who's never had a family history or knew anything about FSHD. So that's why we try to capture history of when did you notice the first symptoms, you know, and then when were you finally clinically diagnosed. But then it's really hard sometimes to think 20, 30 years back and really just, you know, discern, like, when was that? When did I really experience that? And like, and it might be sooner, right? And so it is extremely hard to capture because it is hard to remember back. You're proving my point. That's exactly it. And because of the advancements in genetic testing and the new ways that we do diagnosis, mm -hmm. it's not material to keep referring to infant onset because it is so subjective. It is so much a matter of, I mean, if, if you know Michael's story, then you know that he was at the Cleveland Clinic, that he had many FSH symptoms. He traveled to the top research centers around North America, didn't get a diagnosis until our son started having symptoms. And I went, oh, you and him this is the same thing, we need to figure this out. So that's exactly it. Because it's so problematic, because this isn't something that stands up and holds water in a quantitative way, let's not hold on to it, right? It's something that pulls us back. It's not something that lends credibility to the science. Yeah, but I mean, there is, though, I mean, there are certain, there are certain manifestations in early onset kids that are not seen in adults um, or later onset, uh, such as hearing loss, retinal vascular disease. Um, and, and so there is, there is a difference. I mean, there's a lot of overlap. There's, uh, there's nothing consistent with FSH. There's, you can see within the same family, a spectrum of severity of the disease. But it is important to look at the kids because we need the clinical outcome measures appropriate for kids uh, if we are going to do clinical trials in in, uh, in kids. Then, then we need to assume yes. that all children, then we need to screen the families, right? So we have a big backlog of families not getting screened, right? And then we need to scoop up all the kids who do have FSH, but weren't screened. And then that causes other problems because there's a lot of doctors who, and I understand the moral reasons in the US, will hold off on diagnosis because of the insurance implications. There's a great many physicians with a big heart who don't want to have that conversation because of what it means. So whereas in Canada, we could do these studies with more alacrity, it's, it's more challenging here. And I think we do have a clinical outcome measure, right? I think we're, you know, we're all trying to suppress DUX4. Right. That, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the holy ground. Yeah, I mean, if, we, if we can, yeah. Well, the tax for a toxic program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the therapeutics need to target that. Right. So, I mean, it can, it's the same target, but it, it's just, again, I mean, you, you want to try to go in and, and um, be able to measure the improvement. I would agree with you, though, about hearing loss and Coates disease. And I think that's where. It, we might have a better juncture, especially with some of the new biomarkers, maybe even interleukin-6. Like, this is something that maybe we could make headway. But if we're looking just at why, you know, some of my kids exactly were diagnosed at infancy or early on because we had a family history and others weren't, it doesn't, doesn't hold water. Yeah. I mean, the, the other problem in the U.S. is the, the cost of the genetic testing. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's not, it, it's, it cannot be... A, part of a panel that's cheap and can 
test a hundred different diseases. Well, I mean, Peter Peter Jones has helped a lot with that, but yeah. 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 Um, the only, so I'm Michaela, I'm from Kansas City at KU. The only thing I wanted to add is I think we realized that this might have been a problem with some of our past trials. So with the MOVE FSHD study in general, we really tried to capture people from not only head to toe, but also what's happened over their lifespan. So it asks you, what were your first symptoms? Like what brought you to the doctor? When were you diagnosed? Did you get a genetic test? What symptoms are you experiencing and when did that start? It also asks about hearing loss, you know, if you have vision problems, if you're using assistive devices. So I think in a sense, we realized that we might not have been capturing the full picture and that we're trying to do that moving forward because um, it really is asking what symptoms do you have? When did you have them? What brought you to the doctor? When did you get diagnosed? When did you get genetic testing? Did anybody else in your family get genetic testing or has this disease? So I think we are, we're doing, we've learned a lot from the studies that we've done in the last, you know, especially five years, I would say. And so I think that we're asking better and more specific questions going forward. Um, and then I do agree with, you know, everyone obviously has probably had FSHD their entire life, but the I think to Ruby's point is that some of these kids that come in when they're very, very young look kind of different from and have different problems than some of their adult counterparts. And so the question, question for Kayla, so, so you'd see them on a on a magnified basis, right? They are much more severe. That's yes. Nice. So I think for us as clinicians and researchers, the question is, again, why? Why are these kids potentially much more severe than their adult counterparts? And potentially their trajectory is a little different too. And that's important for us to understand as researchers is what is the difference between adults and peds? Is there a difference? Um, and you know why that difference is and how you treat it. Mm -hmm. well, we, we, we do know, right? Because we know the cycle of DEX4 and we, we know the relationship with mitochondrial reactive oxygen species, et cetera. So we do have some of that information. Right, yeah. And then just validating, that's like, Basically, it's validating that that information is true, and then how do you measure it, and how do you keep moving forward? And like, our treatment's going to have to be different between those people who are much more severe versus people who are more mild or moderate. Those are my thoughts. Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, I was the first one in my family to be diagnosed with it. Um, I wasn't diagnosed till I was 42 years old. But looking back, I think there were signs that I never would have recognized it didn't have anything to do with it, not being able to put my arms up over my head, things like that. Um, my father probably had onset of symptoms when he was probably in his late 50s, early 60s. I was 42. I have a brother 10 years younger than me, uh, tested positive for FSHD, but totally asymptomatic. Uh, my sister, personally and professionally, younger than me. Never chose to be tested, but totally asymptomatic. So whether we had it or not, you know, at the time. Um, yes, and like I said, the age of onset and being able to recognize exactly what it is. It's, you know, the FSHD is not what brought me to a neurologist early on. And sometimes I like vertigo. So yeah. I'm here for that. And by the way, doc, I can't tell my toes. And then led to a diagnosis of FSHD. Um, my brother, like I said, asymptomatic, uh, went to New York City Marathons. Um, so it's hard in that sense, you know, to uh, really come to a conclusion you know, about how it runs in the family. Um, nothing the sister has what you don't know. Uh, and children, asymptomatic, nothing. Yeah. But my question also is in clinical trials, to me, it doesn't seem like we're looking at a lot of people. 11 children or 160 adults, what percentage of maybe people who apply to like a clinical trial actually get into the clinical trial? Uh, is it, are there many more people who might apply and you only select certain numbers or it doesn't seem like we well, So, I mean, two things, one, the observational studies, yeah. and then there's the clinical trials that yeah. are different in, for clinical trials. Um, because you want to be able to see an improvement over kind of a reasonable period of time, you try to get the, the patients who are kind of in the middle of, of the spectrum of severity. In natural history studies, it should be, it's, it's, it's looser. I mean, we take almost everybody in. Um, 
But I think there are other factors, I mean, uh, coming back to that, that determine severity that we don't know about. And, and some of that may be the methylation differences, even in two people, you know, a brother and sister who have the same number of repeats. Uh, and so I think that's a factor that's not been clarified completely yet. Yeah, um, on her point, two things. On her point, um, after I was diagnosed, they kind of looked back at my life and said, that makes sense because I was never a good runner. I was really not real coordinated. There were a lot of things that all of a sudden go, well, yeah, that really makes sense as to, as to having the disease. And my other question is the reason for um, child MRIs, is there a reason that children are not put in the MRI machine or is there dangers involved in that or is it something they just never do? No, Natalie was saying that they did do it. They had they had eleven kids participate. Oh, right, but they're only doing that now. Is that something that they do that to children all the time, or is that? No, I mean it, it's it's done in in this particular setting to look and see if um, the changes on the MRI match the okay compression of the disease. Yeah, yeah. Um, Which of course it did, right? Now, yeah. you know, you you don't generally experience. You know, significant clinical symptoms until your muscles are sort of hitting the 50% fat fraction. Like you may not notice it until then. Um, but I have a question for this gentleman. When did you experience vertigo? We're going to have a lot of time to later. Yeah. So, uh, let, let's move on. Um, I'd like to have uh, uh, Darren Kilber come up. I, uh, Cannon is working with the New York uh, Department. It is actually uh, an important national project that involves multiple states uh, to really look at in depth at, at the population of patients who have the SAP and what the patients are. So again, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Shannon Kilburn from the New York State Department of Health. And I'll be talking about the Muscular Dystrophy Surveillance Tracking and Research Network, or MD StarNet and FSHC. So what is MD StarNet? It is a multi-site um, population-based surveillance system. It is the only um, surveillance program in the US which captures health information on people with muscular dystrophies in certain areas of the US. Um, it identifies and defines individuals in, with muscular dystrophy, such as Duchenne or Beck, myotonic, Lindbergh, facial scalpelo humero, which we're going to be talking about more in depth, emerodrifus, distal muscular, and congenital. Um, for methodology, um, the institutional review, we already have, well, MD Starnet has in institutional review board approval, um, either and or public health um, authority. And um, this varied by site. Again, it is a population-based active surveillance where sites identify and abstract data on individuals living and deceased within the geographic area. Longitudinal follow-up occurs Longitudinal follow-up occurs um, via re-abstraction to obtain information on follow-up visits. Medical records are the primary source, mostly from your muscular clinics, but also from hospitals, neurology pra um, practices, specialty clinics. And we also collect information and administrative data um, from sources such as the birth and death certificates, um, national death index searches, and hospital discharge data. So um, we're currently in phase four of the data collection process. Um, phase four funding cycle is from um, 2019 to 2024. 
Um, the proper nutrient includes um, the seven types of muscular dystrophy, including FSHD, um, the one that I named before. Um, data collection will include um, a follow-up of definite and probable cases. And um, we define definite cases as um, those that have um, documented clinical symptoms and diagnosis by DNA analysis. And um, probable cases were um, defined as those that have um, documented clinical symptoms, family history that is consistent with dominant inheritance, but does not meet the criteria for definite cases. Um, data collection will also um, include, um, well, data collection are from surveillance sites that are in Iowa, South Carolina, Virginia, Utah, 21 counties of um, Western New York, 31 counties in North Carolina and 23 counties in Northern Florida. So um, this is a map of the United States where um, the um, areas that are shaded in um, darker green are the current um, surveillance sites. And this one is another course of New York State and I'm highlighted in orange are the counties that are currently um, Surveillance um, sites. Um, so no one to FSHD. Uh, so we did um, data analysis on um, New York FSHD um, data that we had, and um, the data that were included. Um, the, uh, well, the data was from the MD StarNet, and um, to be included. Um, Individuals must have been residents of the of site, which is like the 21 counties of New York State that I mentioned earlier, um, and had at least one health visit at any point in time between January 1st, 2008 and um, December 31st, 2019. Um, they must have been diagnosed with FSHD on or before December 31st, 2019. Um, again, the surveillance period was from January 1st, 2008 to um, December 31st, 2019. Um, the sites included um, what I mentioned before, Florida, Iowa, North Carolina, South Carolina, Utah, Virginia, and Western New York. Um, collected information um, includes DNA testing, comorbid conditions, information about employment, family history, insurance history, um, primary caregiver. Um, so where do we find cases? Um, local data source for Western New York counties include um, the following um, neuromuscular um, clinics, um, such as Bent Neurologic Institute, which is in Buffalo, John R. O'Shea Children's Hospital, New Jersey Clinic, also in Buffalo, University of Buffalo, um, University of Rochester, the Muscular Disease Clinic, and Upstate um, University Hospital, which is in Syracuse. Um, data is also collected from administrative data sets, such as the Spiritualized Planning and Research Cooperative System, also known as SPARCS. Um, this is um, basically hospital discharge data. Um, we also collect information from birth report registry, vital records, which includes birth and birth certificates. Um, so currently there is a new uh, muscular dystrophy survey that has been introduced to assist with addressing gaps in knowledge, such as um, experiences with pain, fatigue, pregnancy, infertility, um, experiences with COVID-19 disease and vaccination. Um, so we've already received the IRB approval and um, we're anticipating that we'll start the trial or initial phase in um, the summer, this summer and summer. Mm -hmm. um, recruitment will begin by mailing introductory letters to inform individuals about the study. Um, the mail will include um, enclosure forms where, where participants can include, can select whether they prefer um, web-based, paper mail, or an administrative survey, and um, the mail will also include postage envelopes. Um, so for the methods, um, the survey will primarily be web-based or by paper mail, but a phone option is also available. Um, the individuals are identified from the local MD StarNet surveillance database. Um, to be included, um, participants have to be um, 18 years of age or older as of the start of the study. 
um, has to be diagnosed with one of the eight types of um, irregular muscular dystrophies, including FSHD. Um, and they have to be current um, residents of the site. Um, so the information the survey will collect um, includes um, information about COVID-19 and influenza, which uh, will focus on collecting um, information such as the percentage of adults with muscular dystrophy who've had um, COVID-19 disease. Second, we'll collect information about um, pain and fatigue, and that will include um, information about the percentage of adults with muscular dystrophy who reported um, pain and fatigue and also about pregnancy and fertility, information such as common pregnancy complications and outcomes among adult women with muscular dystrophy will be collected. Um, so I analyzed local New York FSHD surveillance data and the following is what we've learned so far. So um, for demographic characteristics, um, we can see from the table that more than half of the individuals were male, that's a 57%. Most were non Hispanic whites, and that's um, approximately 89%, and approximately 95% of individuals were living, and more than half were married. Um, so, regarding employment, one third of individuals were employed, um, which is 35.5%, um, followed by those who were disabled and unable to work, um, and those who had retired. Um, the smallest percentages represent those who reported as students, underage, or unemployed. For health insurance, 43.9% um, of individuals reported that they had private um, insurance followed by public insurance, which was um, 30.5%. Um, approximately 1% of um, individuals reported that they had no health insurance coverage. Um, in terms of care mood, in terms of care mood, um, the majority um, of the individuals reported that they were self caregivers or independent, um, while approximately five percent um, reported that they were cared for by parents. Um, other types of caregivers included um, spouse, institution, or facility. Um, represented the smaller. So, in terms of clinical characteristics. Uh, most of the individuals um, had FSHD1 diagnosis, however, we did not have um, FSHD type documented for 20% um, of the individual. Um, this is also consistent with um, scientific literature, which estimated that approximately 5% of um, all FSHD cases are FSHD2, and the vast majority um, are FSHD1. Uh, so in terms of mobility, approximately 62% um, were ambulatory and independent, followed by um, individuals who um, use wheelchair, whether um, full-time or part-time, that represented a total of 22.5%, and those who were ambulatory but used the devices, which represented 15%. Um, this is also consistent with scientific literature. Um, where it was reported that approximately 20% of affected individuals may eventually become wheelchair dependent. And we see that the average age at partial or complete loss of mobility was 61 years old with a minimum of um, age 30, um, ranging to age 77. Um, the average age at last um, clinical visit was um, 52 years old. <laughs> Um, so in terms of um, parents um, who were diagnosed, parents who were also diagnosed, 57% um, of the individuals also had at least one parent who was diagnosed with FSHD. Um, in terms of um, comorbid conditions, we only had comorbid conditions documented for 17 of the 107 Western New York cases. Um, the comorbid conditions um, were fixed disease, epilepsy, hearing loss, retinal detachments, and retinal vasculopathy. Of this, hearing loss was the most frequently reported. So to summarize, 
most individuals diagnosed with FSHD in Western New York through 2019 in the state were um, diagnosed with FSHD type 1, that was 74%, were alive, were able to care for themselves, were either employed or disabled and unable to work, um, had either private health insurance or public health or public insurance, um, were ambulatory and independent, present 50%. With a mean age at partial or total loss of population of 61 years old. Only 17 individuals with comorbid conditions were um, was documented and most reported here in loss. Um, so, for current research and next step, we will be ongoing surveillance to identify new FSHD mm -hmm. cases to determine the number of people living with FSHD. Mm -hmm. um, there will be ongoing abstraction of medical records to determine comorbidities, um, healthcare service use, mobility, employment, and survival. Um, we'll also have ongoing uh, research on FSHD using MD StarNet surveillance data. Um, there are current Currently, um, a number of projects that are out there in the works. Um, these include um, projects that will be estimating the number of people in the rate of FSHD, which is basically prevalence, and examining differences in demographic and socioeconomic factors, also investigating the average age at diagnosis, and um, describing the most common procedures, hospitalizations, and their associated costs, and describing health outcomes such as readmission and survival. Um, the news, there will also be a new survey, as I mentioned before, to better understand the experiences of COVID-19 disease and vaccination, pain, fatigue, pregnancy, and fertility. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge um, my fellow colleagues at the New York State Department of Health and our consultancies in different sites. Um, for helping to make this project possible. Um, this project is funded um, by the um, What does um, the New York State Department intend to do with this data that's been collected? Yes, yeah, so basically, um, they used to do a lot of epidemiologic um, research. So currently there are some, you know, research um, proposals out there that we're working on. So um, we're also working to, well, the MD started this type of, you know, collecting information, follow-up information, uh, we get the new extracted data. We also include those um, to use to do um, for research. It's much more rare. Any question? So, are, so you said there's a, a mailing list for people to be um, aware of the survey. So is it only for people who are in the current clinics or is there another way for people who maybe don't go to these current clinics to get on the mailing list to participate? So um, they haven't started the whole process yet. Um, I was told that hopefully by the summer. Um, so currently um, they're planning to include all the people that are already um, in the MD started surveillance, but they're also interested in, you know, getting new participants that are eligible. Um, I'm not sure how they're planning to, you know, communicate this to people outside of the current um, surveillance sites. So I'd have to like check in with my PI to find out more about that. Now, this is really important information. I mean, to, to one of the things that we don't know about is kind of the disease burden of FSH. Uh, um, in, you know, even within neurology, uh, you know, everybody thinks of FSH as, oh, it's the mild muscular dystrophy. Um, but so the information that the state is collecting in, um, I, I think is very important. Um, and when combined across the country, it will give us some real uh, data about the prevalence and 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 and, and all of the associated problems that patients with SSH have. So next, um, my colleague uh, Johanna Hamill is going to talk about uh, recent trials in the
Okay, so yeah, I will be talking about current clinical trials, um, just an overview update and uh, upcoming clinical trials that will start or launch in the next couple of weeks. Um, so it's far from being comprehensive, there will be more down the line. Um, but just a snapshot. And to start with disclosures, I have small disclosures, but they are unrelated to FSHD, unrelated to any company involved in this talk, and any in, totally unrelated to any data that I will show them. Um, and so again, I will talk about current clinical treatment trials and upcoming clinical treatment trials. And just be aware, a clinical trial is, as you heard, different than an, a study or observational study. A clinical trial encompasses studies that involve a treatment, uh, a drug, but it can also be an intervention like exercise or behavioral intervention. That's also a clinical trial. But I will talk about treatment trials in FSHD. Um, and I think it's important to kind of go through, a, a lot of you are experts in this, so I'm just going to bear with me, don't get too bored. But I think it's important before we go and talk about these trials to be clear on the terminology and just review some of the terms that come up um, uh, when you talk about clinical trials all the time. Or if you decide to participate in a clinical trial, you will read a consent form and it will have a lot of that terminology in it as well. And so when we talk about a clinical trial, I just mentioned it, it's a drug or an intervention that um, hasn't been proven to work, but um, you all and all participants uh, that are able to participate in the trial will help to determine whether that drug or that intervention is safe and effective. And so that's a clinical trial. Um, randomized or randomization means that individuals will be randomly assigned to receive the drug or the placebo or the control will be in the control group. So that's by chance. Placebo controlled, what is a placebo control? Um, so the safety and the effect of a certain intervention or a drug will be compared to a group of individuals that are not receiving the drug um, or the intervention, but they are, that are receiving something else, a placebo, which is a pill or a substance that has no therapeutic value. So for example, a sugar pill um, or an infusion that just uh, includes normal saline. Um, Double-blinded means that neither you um, or us, neither the participant nor the study team will know who's getting what, um, placebo or drug. And that usually that blinded uh, portion um, will last until all the data is analyzed um, to just make sure we get the best quality data and we don't get biased um, because we know what we want to see and we have certain wishes that can Im impact our ability to assess things. Um, so what are eligibility criteria? In clinical trials, you heard Dr. Tuvul say that often clinical trials um, sponsors and study teams want to include people that are in, kind of in the middle of their disease course, so not too mildly affected, not too severely affected. Um, and why is that the case? Um, so there are these requirements that need to be met, and it, it's, um, it's really to increase the chances that participants participating in those trials, in the early phase trials, have the best chance to have no adverse event or side effect, really to have the best chance to tolerate um, the intervention of the drug, and also to have the best chance to show an effect of a drug if there is one. Um, and that can result in screen failures. And um, so if you come and you screen for a, for a clinical trial, uh, you may not meet some of those requirements um, and then the screen fail. Screen fail means that a participant who, who undergoes the screening cannot proceed to enroll. And this can occur um, if a participant decides otherwise, um, you know, withdraws consent or does not meet one of those eligibility criteria. For example, doesn't meet certain functional measures, functional strength measures, medical 
other medical problems might exclude um, that person or laboratory requirements. You know, something pops up in the blood work that was not anticipated or or is not accepted in that trial. Doesn't mean doesn't mean necessarily that there's a problem with that, but it just doesn't meet those narrow uh, criteria that are that are required for those trials. And so again, I'll get to the trials, but just to pause here real quick, what does it look like? when you um, anticipate, so there's a screening visit right here. And then, and then so on. Uh, if you pass the screening, you know, the eligibility criteria is on the baseline. So that's where randomization usually occurs, which means you get assigned by chance to either the treatment arm or um, the placebo control arm. And then not with all clinical trials, but with quite a few, there is an open label phase, um, which means that not doing this. Oh, let me just do something real quick to get the um this oops there. Laser pointer. Okay, that does it. Um you can move on to the open label phase, which means everyone gets drugged. Um the people that were on placebo get drug and the people that were on drug continue to take drug. Um and then let's think about the different phases because Someone mentioned earlier, there's only a few people in those clinical trials. It's not representative of who actually has FSHD in the community. That's very true. Um, and it, there's a reason for that because there's phase one trials, phase two trials, and phase three trials usually. And phase one trials are really early trials where there is a smaller number of people in it because the goal is really to establish, is this drug safe? And what dose shall we be using? And so you'd like to answer that question in the, you know, as few people as, as possible to get a good answer, because then you move on to the phase two trial where the focus is more, is this drug actually working? Is it effective? And in addition, you gather more safety data. And then moving on, you go to a phase three trial where you confirm effectiveness. So you confirm that a drug is actually showing an effect if you had positive uh, results here in the phase two trial. Um, and so ideally, if a drug is promising and has an effect, you move through all these phases um, and uh, hopefully with little delays as possible. Now let's move on to um, FSHD and the, uh, the, what is so unique about FSHD is, as you've heard, um, if you discover the underlying root cause of the disease, that's a major accomplishment and that took a long time in FSHD um, because then you can really tackle the root cause. So it's not like you know giving Tylenol for a headache, just treating the symptoms. No, it's actually trying to change the trajectory of the disease, change the progression, or even stop it or improve it. And you can do that if you remove DUX4, as um, you've heard before, DUX4 is the protein that's not in healthy muscle. It doesn't belong in muscle, and it is expressed and is present in FSHD muscle. And if you remove DUX4, that's what you need to do to treat FSHD. And there is a reason why it's in the muscle. Um, it's complex. It's just kind of outlined roughly here. And I don't want to go into detail too much, but basically there is a gene that carries the DUX4 on it. And usually it's silenced. It's not supposed to do anything, but in FSHD, it kind of opens up, gets transcribed into RNA, and then uh, the DUX4 RNA then gets um, uh, made into DUX4 protein. And that's causing the trouble in the muscle. Um, because it um, activates a lot of downstream effects and, um, and other diseases. And so where can you tackle this disease? You can tackle it on at the that level of DNA and you've heard gene therapy, that's this big word out there, um, which re really means um, you know changing the DNA, which isn't happening in current clinical trials. Maybe that's something for the future, um, but we're not there yet. Um, but tackling the disease at the RNA level, and that's what's happening right now. So preventing that RNA um, from being made into protein. And then you can tackle it on the protein level. And eventually you can tackle it also downstream here, you know, um, alter all these effects that DOX4 has on the protein, tackle each of those effects. So there are numerous approaches and strategies. And um, the current clinical trials and the upcoming clinical trials are using different strategies, different avenues. And that's great because if one doesn't work, there is another one that will be tested. Um, and maybe in the future, we get into a luxurious position where we have not just one drug, but several drugs that target these different, um, you know, uh, uh, targets in different 
levels. And then we have to decide how we're going to use those drugs. Are we supposed to use them in combination? And who should get getting which drug? Those are all questions that we as clinicians and clinical research have to answer with your help. Um, and then other, other uh, here. Um, so what are these current clinical trials that we're so excited about? Um, so there is one uh, upcoming that I'll talk about, the Fortitude uh, sponsored by Avidity, testing a drug I'll talk about that tackles um, the DOC score RNA. And then we have um, the Fulcrum sponsored uh, program, which uh, uh, is focused on Los Mapa mode. And we'll hear quite a bit about that, which was tested in the Redux 4 trial and has now moved on to the phase three trial, reach FSHD. And that um, reduces the Dux4 protein in the muscle as well. So those are disease targeted FSHD specific treatment approaches. Sorry, Joanna, I don't think it actually has been shown to reduce the Dux4 protein. That's a question. Yeah. Correct? I take that. Yes, that's very correct because that was the primary outcome. So the last map mode um, in the um, dish, in the muscle culture, muscle myotube culture, there it reduced the Dux4 protein. And that's why it was moved on from the dish into a clinical trial and was picked as a, as a candidate for treatment. But in the patient actually itself, that's true. Um, the muscle biopsy uh, biomarker measure didn't work. So that has no improvement. That's very correct. Um, so, but that's where, so I guess to uh, be more precise, those mapping mode in the dish, in the preclinical studies, chose to reduce Dux4 protein, and that's why it was picked uh, to be tested in patients in the first place. So now there are other approaches um, for, that are not, you know, FSH specific. Um, for example, just improving muscle strength or function. So for example, we'll talk a little bit about the myostatin inhibitor. Um, drugs um, that are being tested and were tested in the past. And then there was the starfish study that used growth hormone and testosterone to see if muscle function um, can be improved that way. Um, so moving on to current clinical trials. So we'll talk a little bit about Los Mapa mode, which was first tested in the Redux 4 trial and then uh, is now being tested in the phase three trial, which is REACH FSHD. Los Mapa mode, um, is a drug that um, inhibits um, a certain pathway um, that kind of regulates cell cycle and cell apoptosis. And in the preclinical studies, so muscle cell studies, not the patient studies, um, it, reduced it, it reduced the Dux4 expression and um, that's why it was picked. And it was kind of um, a, uh, a good way to go into clinical trials right away because there was a lot of safety data on this drug because this drug had been used in um, over 3,500 3, trial participants, at least in, had been given one dose for other, for other indications. For example, it was tested in COPD and depression and in, car in uh, heart, uh, um, heart attacks patients. So it was known, it was a lot known, a lot was known about this drug, what it, um, how it behaves in, in humans, um, but not in FSHD. So what does this trial program, what does a program look like? First, um, and again, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just presenting here um, the, the, some of the data and um, those slides were provided by Fulcrum as a courtesy. Um, but first they had to do the preclinical styles, uh, trial, uh, studies, then they um, tested whether the, the drug gets in the muscle. And then next, um, at phase two, the Redux4 trial was conducted. It went into the open label phase, which I mentioned, you know, everyone got drug. And then um, it moved on to even a lower, longer open label phase. And now we're at the uh, phase three trial here, down here. But we'll first focus on the, the study that's been completed and look at some of the data and how it played out. Um, so there were 77 participants. They were age, inclusion was 18 to 65. The duration of the trial was 48 weeks. And, um, Several things were measured, including the MRI. And just as a disclosure to your comment, there were also muscle biopsies to, because the primary outcome was to show that Dux4 actually is reduced or eliminated in the muscle. And that um, didn't work, that the trial didn't, didn't meet that primary outcome measure. So that's very clear, but um, to, and so the trial was powered. So, and that's a little complicated, but it, the trial was designed to really show that in the muscle biopsy. And then it had other outcome measures like the MRI and functional outcome measures 
and that when we power trials, we think about how many people do we need statistically um, to show an effect um, for that particular outcome measure. And for those exploratory or secondary outcome measures like the MRI, like the, um, that we'll talk about, um, the trial wasn't really powered. So the number of the participants was really designed to show the muscle biopsy effect. So, but that happens in early trials, um, but we still look at this data. And, and this is pulled from data, obviously, that I'm presenting here with the courtesy that they provided this to me. Um, and um, they, we still look at all those outcome measures because what we want to see, is there an effect, even if it's not powered uh, adequately, is there an effect and is there a good argument to move this drug forward or is there, uh, is there a reason to stop here? Um, and that happens quite a bit too, that you have to stop and a drug doesn't move forward. But what happens in the Redux4 trial is that here on the y-axis, you see the, um, the change uh, from baseline. And this shows the, um, the muscle fat infiltration. And um, what it looks like is that the people that, re that receive placebo, so worsening of muscle fat infiltration goes up and improvement of muscle fat infiltration would go down. And so what was shown here is that the people who were taking placebo seem to have more muscle fat infiltration compared to those who were given plasmapa mode. And then the reachable workspace, if you participate in any uh, study or trial, you will probably end up doing this. It's a, it's a way um, that uh, an outcome measure that was developed um, that uses a sensor-based system and visualization to um, quantify upper limb, upper limb motion. Can you just go back to the previous slide for one second? What is the... Yeah, the one before. Yeah, thank you. And that's percentage? Um, this is, uh, that's actually a good question. Um, yes, I think so, yeah. No, those are indices. No, these are the, measures. sorry. Measures. So this is, sorry, this is the, yeah, this is the indices. And what, what units do they represent? It's no units that the way the MRI is run is read with the, the, the muscle fraction index, the, the muscle fat index, sorry. So it's an absolute number. It's an absolute, and, that, and what's the scale? Like what, what's- This is a change from baseline. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I got the change from baseline, but what's the maximum, for example? So I don't remember, right? So it's the percent of fatty replacement in the muscle that they're looking at. So it is a percentage. I would have to check. Okay. Yeah, I would have to check too. Yeah, I think it's just for transparency and it would be good to have the scale there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then just to mention, sometimes you show differences, but this was statistically significant. So I'm not showing any trends or, you know, such. It's, it's yeah. T-tested. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the workspace. Um, so again, it's, it quantified upper limb function um, by visualization and, um, and people, uh, it's sensor-based and it's an outcome measure that's been used and that's been showing that it's sensitive to progression. So it shows a change over time in patients with FSHD. And as you can imagine, it's related to, um, it's, it's relevant because it is related to activities of daily living. Um, so, you know, function of upper limb, eating, self-care, et cetera. And so this is um, the data of, um, in the Redux4 trial, when they looked at annualized rate of change, um, this map emote showed that it slowed disease progression. And so here, um, um, so this is the reachable workspace uh, measured for the no dominant side and for the non-dominant side. So right and, and left for most people, but not for all. And then people also were, were holding a 500 gram weight and so um, with, with that outcome measure, when you look at the change over one year, um, people who were um, taking this map mode uh, here in orange uh, remained fairly stable. Um, and then in the dominant hand, and then this looks like it's going up a little bit on the, on the non-dominant side. And people who were taking placebo um, seemed to decline a little bit. Um, but again, here, the slope wasn't statistically significant on the left, but it was on the right, so there seemed to be a um, a, a change, a difference in uh, progression over a year time. And then, if you looked at, if you added in the open label phase, um, again, you know, a year follow up is, is quite a long time, but the open label phase is going on for a lot longer. And so, when you looked at on the left side, you see the change 
um, again, an, from um, an annual, um, here's 48 weeks, and then here's the open label phase extension at 96 weeks. And then you look at the people that were taking those map mode in the blinded uh, phase, and they continue to take those map mode. It kind of looks, you know, it's kind of stable. And then people who were on placebo, um, again, I'm talking here about the reachable workspace um, out uh, measures from, in addition to the 500 gram weight. They, uh, as I showed earlier, they declined a little bit. And then when they started taking those map mode in the open label phase, it seemed to stabilize this. Um, and similar on the non-dominant side. And basically with a disclosure here, all of that, what I'm just talking about, again, the trial was empowered for those assessments because the primary outcome measure, the really what we wanted to look at was the muscle biomarker. But again, those data are important to inform the next trial and really to confirm, is this really true? Is this a good, is, is this really working? And so the other um, signal that was seen in this data was that people who were on Los Mapa mode um, had a higher chance to report improvement compared to people who were on placebo. And so here on the left side, you see the percentage of people reporting improvement. Um, and on the this here, on this uh, column here, you see the people on Los Mapa mode, and here you see the people on placebo. And um, the, the very dark green means that people reported that they very much improved. Um, the lighter green is much improved, and then the, the you know that is minimally improved. The, the lightest green, and so there was a chance here that was map mode uh, treated people reported um, improvement, a higher chance, and also that there was a higher chance that they reported that they very much improved, while this wasn't reported by people on placebo. Similarly, um, fewer study participants reported worsening. So, for example, here the Los map here this dark purple means that. This is the percentage of people who said that they were uh, much worse and they were more likely to be in the placebo group compared to the Los Mapa mode group. And so what do we do with that um, information? Um, again, it needs to be tested. It needs to be confirmed in a larger group of people. And that's what a phase three trial is for. And so now ongoing, the open label phase four Redux 4 is still ongoing, but the phase three uh, trial has started and is en enrolling. Um, it's a much uh, larger study. Um, it's also, and so here on the left is Redux 4. On the right, you see REACH. That's the phase three clinical trial that's ongoing. And basically this, the, the kind of the signal that I um, showed earlier, um, what it did is it informed the, the, the new trial to make it better and to really design it so that we have a chance to show whether it works or it doesn't work. And so the, the duration was picked also again to be 48 weeks. The reachable workspace is now the primary endpoint, point, so no muscle biopsies. Um, the um, MRI um, has a little bit more weight in that study. And of course, patient reported outcomes. So what you feel um, is um, it was selected too. And the study is uh, uh, you know adequately powered to show effects in these measurements. So that's what what it does. This is why a phase two clinical trial is important um, to, um, and I, what I didn't even mention, I should have said is that the, you know, we knew that Los Mapa mode was fairly safe in patients without FSHD, and it showed that it's um, quite safe in patients with FSHD as well. So I didn't talk about the safety data because it was quite important. Yeah. I have two questions. Yes. When you say that it's safe, um, how many years of data is that? So now we have up to 144 uh, weeks. Eight. 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 Yeah, years, months. Sorry, oh. but I'm, I have it. So 144 weeks of FSHD. Um, uh, so that's before, before this. Um, before the trial. Yeah, like how many years have yeah. you been on this drug for us oh. to say that yeah, it's that's safe? A that's a good question. And I didn't say it's safe, right? I said there's just safety data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, all, I, all I said was that there were 3, 000, more than 3,500 people uh, received at least one dose. Um, I don't know how long those COPD and heart attack trials were. I would have to look that up. But they, you know, they're usually like, yeah, you can maybe comment. Yeah, so I'm, I'm from Fern Crumb. So yeah, those were the short duration trials, especially because uh, they, they showed they learned very quickly that the drug was not working in the disease the way they tested it, so that there is no long-term safety data from the uh, 
the fiscal. Yeah, we don't have, have long term no. data on the graph. No, so the, the longest uh, data that, that are available now are the ones from the. Uh, how many, how, 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 how long do you need in a phase one trial? Oh, so the phase, yeah. yeah. For you to be able to say that a, a drug is safe. So the, the, I need to qualify a lot of things. So the phase one is, is designed to detect acute, what we call acute toxicity. So something that's going, that are going to happen in, in a few days. Um, and, and so for a phase one uh, study, you start by giving, it's very, very controlled. So you give a small dose to, a small number of people, you follow them, it depends a little bit for about two weeks, then if everything is fine, you give a, a, a little higher dose, and then you continue like this, right. one dose. If this is completely, and you look at a lot of things, clean and people, so this, this is done in healthy individuals, they are in a clinic, like locked, locked up in a clinic. If um, nothing happened with these people, then, then you take another batch of healthy individuals and then you give them multiple doses and it depends usually 10 to 15 days. So again, those we are talking about what we call acute. Right, you know, so acute you're not acute. looking really so, at long -term. No, 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 it's really, it, you know, it, it's like a, a, a thief. So you look mm. first by things that are, you know, very common that, are, that occur very quickly. Yeah, but for, yeah. for, for FDA approval, you don't need years of uh, safety data. So it gets approved, but then it's important to do phase four trials or, you know, past marketing surveillance study where you actually develop, where you actually look at, and that's up to us clinicians too. What does it actually do in the real world? Does it actually work in the real world? And is it safe in the real world? So that's exactly what you're pointing out. Yeah. And, and what we can say now is there is no evidence of safety issues. But that doesn't mean that it's evidence of safety issue. It doesn't mean that there is no safety right. concern. But so far, the, 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 the safety looks good. So far, that's really the key word here. It's a P38 inhibitor, right? So P38, there, there are multiple forms of P38. So it's a P38 alpha beta uh, inhibitor. So I'm just trying to flush out your question. Can we borrow? Is there any, I asked him, he didn't know. Um, is, do we, do we have any safety data from any of the other P38 alpha beta? Yes, we do. And, and we also know, we know what P38 alpha beta does. Yeah. Um, and we have not seen, so for example, it affects, the, it can affect the immune system. We have not seen this effect and that is Probably because Short the drug, no, no, the drug does not inhibit P38 alpha beta to 100%. So there is some some activity that is preserved. How does it impact the immune system? It's, <laughs> how much time do you have? Yeah, right. it's, such, it's such an important question, though. I'm, I'm, because I have like, I, I have immune conditions, and I mean these things are important, and I'm really being very open and honest here. Like we've just gone through a major. Yeah. with a drug that came out and we're seeing horrible effects from it and not your drug, but I'm just, yeah. it's no, no. now starting, I've never asked this question it's before, a, so yeah. I'm, it's very top of mind for me as a patient. It's a legitimate uh, concern, but I can tell you it's among the 3,500 patients, mm -hmm. uh, some had rheumatoid arthritis, and so let's see if you can see, and, and the reason why they tried it is because of this effect. The, the, they didn't see efficacy, but they didn't see toxicity. Do you think that if you have sort of an underlying immune condition, it could it could bring it on? So this is when when you and I was talking about the uh, eligibility criteria for yeah. clinical trial. Yeah. Is you, usually we want patients who don't have too many other diseases because then that make it you know the drug may or may not work if you have another disease, or you could have safety issues that. Uh, you know, happen while you're under trial, and then we need to determine whether it's due to the drug itself, to your other disease, or to the combination of both. Right. So that's why you have really, you know, fairly strict LGBT criteria for, for trials. Let me add one thing quickly. Then. So, so I was on a safety monitoring committee for the first study, and you couldn't tell the difference between placebo and active you know, for the direct study. Yeah, I'm just now so much more aware of sort of length of time, sure. just as a patient, yeah. and so like a year is nothing, yeah. you know. Like, Absolutely. so yeah. I'm I've never 
asked that question before in yeah. in any meeting and it's just not something i've become very aware of yeah and th that's a great point because we also as a clinical field need to get ready to be ready to do all these post marketing surveillance studies yeah. and face because we need to know how people are doing in the community and we need to have the infrastructure to study that and not just here's the drug you know and drug. also if people don't know that this type of inhibitor can 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 like we should be told to watch out on our immune systems because if something comes up and is weird like a regular doctor probably wouldn't know yeah so so that you're absolutely right and so when you participate in a clinical trial you are given a fairly lengthy document called an informed consent form and, and in there it tells you what what are the possible side effects of the drug and, and also you're given a card uh, that says, you know, my name is X, I have FSHD, I'm participating in a clinical trial with this experimental drug. And if you can get information by calling the principal investigator of the trial, if you go to an emergency room or to a new doctor. Right. So that's, there are all these measures that are put in place to address exactly what's. But the other, yeah. But the, the other point I just wanted to make real quick is that if a drug gets FDA approved, to your point, it was tested, even if it's tested in a phase three trial, it will be tested in people who don't have all these comorbidities, who don't have autoimmune disease, et cetera. But then it will get FDA approved if everything goes well, and then it will likely be approved for everyone with FSHD. And then you, as a clinician, stand there and you have to judge, is this particular drug that's safe? That's exactly what I'm, case? yeah. And that's going to be a conversation between you and your clinician um, informed by all the data, but there will still be some unknown and something that still needs to be tested and yeah. followed up. Out. That's, so, ex that's exactly what, yeah. what it's going to yeah, be. Yeah, because there are a lot of people, we can talk about clinical trials all day long, but there's so many people that can't even participate in clinical trials because they do have these other diseases, <laughs> but we still want to treat them long term. Mm -hmm. So very, very good point. Um, but I'll move on to um, upcoming clinical trials um, and um, uh, Dr. To Will will be the, the lead on those two um, here in Rochester. But uh, the first one is uh, the Roche study uh, sponsored trial that uses um, a myostatin in inhibitor or an anti-myostatin antibody. And so what is myostatin? It's a protein. And again, looking back at this, you know, where are we treating FSHD? It's a it's a, a approach that um, kind of tries to get the muscle in better shape without um, um, directly uh, um, interfering with the FSH cascade or the mechanism. But so myostatin is a protein that regulates muscle mass. It um, inhibits muscle growth. So if you inhibit myostatin, you may help uh, grow the muscle in size and strength. That's the thought. It's been tested in FSHD in the past and in, in CMT as well. Um, this, this new um, drug is an investigational antimyostatin antibody and it has the goal to increase the muscle size and growth. And I mentioned there was a prior study that um, tested it in FSHD and over six months, um, there was not an improvement in function. But now then there was a thought, maybe it wasn't the right drug. Maybe we have to make the drug better. And second, maybe six months is not long enough um, to test this because you know, in Los Mapi mode, the, the year uh, was, was critical to show, to show uh, some signal. So um, now Roche is doing another study, a phase two um, multi-center randomized placebo control, double-blinded. Um, it's going to be conducted in several countries, as you can see here in the US um, as well. And it's a subcutaneous in injection every four weeks. The duration is 52 weeks. Um, and um, there is an extension option afterwards. Uh, 48 participants is the goal to enroll, and the outcome will be, the primary outcome, there will be lots of measurements, but uh, the primary outcome will be to see if the muscle can grow in size um, as measured by MRI. And so people can enroll that are 18 to 65 years in age. They have to be able to walk unassisted. And just uh, as a disclosure, this is a snapshot of the eligibility criteria, so there is more, um, but you need to have, uh, be able to have, have an MRI. Um, and no major other illnesses or other medical problems. But again, that's um, always worth a review with your um, study clinician, whether you fall into this category, if you have an interest. Um, and then the next trial I want to talk about is the Fortitude trial. This is um, sponsored by Avidity. Um, and it, again, that one targets the, the mechanism of um, 
FSHD. And um, I happen to have been this the investigator um, for this trial in a different muscular dystrophy in Rochester. My tonic dystrophies will be gained from experience there um, with, the, with the same platforms. Um, and so what this does is um, it's, a, it's a drug that has three components. It's, um, it has the, the effective drug, which is an siRNA. Um, it is bound to a, a little linker, and then, the, then it is bound to a monoclonal antibody to the transferrin receptor. And so why does it need three components if this red thing is really the drug that is doing its job and um, with a goal to reduce DUX4? Well, um, it's been shown in other trials that it's sometimes it's hard to get a drug into the muscle. You can give it into blood, give an infusion, but how do you get it actually into the muscle? And previous studies in muscular dystrophy using antisense oligonucleotides, for example, the IONIS trial, um, failed to get the, the, the drug into the muscle at the right dosages to be effective. And so people had to work on this for a couple of years to find a way how to deliver how to fix the delivery problem and how to deliver the drug into the muscle. And so this approach using a mon monoclonal antibody to a receptor, transparent receptor is a way, and I picture it as a, like a Trojan horse. You put your drug on a vehicle, you send the vehicle to the cell, the, the um, vehicle kind of bounds to the cell, gets taken up into the cell, and then the vehicle doesn't matter anymore. It's just basically to get it into the, into the muscle and then the vehicle releases the active component, which is this siRNA. And then the siRNA can do its job, which um, means that it uh, uh, binds to the um, messenger ducts for arm, arm mRNA and silence it and reduces the ducts for protein. That's the goal. It hasn't been proven. That's the scientific um, background. And um, that's now entering clinical trials. And in preclinical preclinical trials that uh, preclinical pre studies, I apologize. Um, this has looked promising, but it hasn't been tested in um, patients with FSHD. So this is a phase one, phase two, but phase one study in adults with FSHD. It's a first in humans. So this particular drug has not been given to humans before, um, and it has um, it's uh, done at multiple centers. It's again uh, double-blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled, and um, it will be given at different dosages. So in those early trials, as I mentioned, you want to make sure you not only establish whether something is safe, but you also want to find what is the right dose that is tolerated and effective. So it, there will be different cohorts to uh, that receive different dosages. Um, there will be 72 participants, um, and then there will be five doses administered um, in, again, different dosing regimens. And a lot is learned along the way. So, for example, the study in myotonic dystrophy, we learned um, we never went up to the highest cohort. We um, just uh, did the first uh, two cohorts, and um, a lot was learned, um, uh, uh, you know, in terms of safety and tolerability and efficacy. And so sometimes um, trial design has to change um, depending on what you learn along the way, specifically in early trials. Um, the, the objective here is to test safety and toler tolerability, but of course, outcome measures will be collected with the MRI and functional measures. Um, and that's really the, the goal. And then there is an open label phase so that people who receive the placebo infusion, normal saline infusion, will have the chance to receive drug. Um, and the eligibility criteria, again, that's just a snapshot. There is a long list um, that people need to meet as requirements, um, but 18 to 65, FSHD 1 and 2 is allowed, and you need to be able to walk uh, 10 meters. You need to be able to have an MRI, that you can have a muscle biopsy, um, yeah, and then one word on expanded access, uh, because I do get that question already from, from other patients I have with, with muscular dystrophy. Um, and so the expanded access means that um, if there is an investigational therapy um, that seems to be promising, um, and so expanded access means that you can have it, that you can receive that drug outside of a clinical trial um, for a serious condition. That's what it's defined as. And the one thing, though, that is required, if you do want expanded access, if you're a clinician, you have a patient in your clinic that cannot enter a clinical trial, but you would like to give it, um, the sponsor or the company needs to make it available. Uh, that's 
if that doesn't if that if that's not the case, you won't be able to even go down that road. And so at the moment, Avidity, for example, um, does not have an expanded access program because they really want to make sure they test it properly um, in the clinical trials. But that's something to look out for in the future um, that might become a, more of a, a, a more of an avenue for people in the clinic once uh, we're getting closer to um, FDA approvals. Um, and then if you want to learn yourself what's out there in terms of clinical trials, um, every clinical trial conducted in the US has to be listed on this website, clinicaltrials.gov. If you type if you uh, type in FSHT, you can type in other terms. If you have something particular you want to look at, um, you get a list of um, trials that you can scroll through and click on and explore yourself. Um, clinical studies that are non-interventional sometimes are also signed up here. But don't have to. So not all studies with uh, not not all studies with FSH are listed there. But the clinical trials have to be listed. And that's how I would like to end. And thank you very much for your attention and the good questions. Uh, let's take a, a minute. No. no, we're going to let's do the panel because lunch is right at twelve thirty-five, and I want to make sure that. Oh. Um, we have time for the panel. Yeah. So Kate, Nicole, Jordan, Cindy, Rabi, if we guys could all come up front, we're going to have a quick panel discussion. Do you want to sit or do you want to stand? Why don't you have them sit? Water. Oh, we are so lucky to have the clinical care team at University of Rochester with us today. And what I'd love to do is just start at this end and have each of you introduce yourselves, say what you do. And um, in the meantime, I want all of you guys to think about as they're introducing themselves, what questions you have for each of these folks. So we will start with Nicole. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. So I'm Nicole, I'm a physical therapist at the University of Rochester. Um, so I work in the clinic, but also in the clinical value so I'm going to work on outcome measures for clinical trials and medical history studies. I'm Kate Kinder. I'm also a physical therapist here at the University of Rochester and I'm doing the same thing similar to Nicole as far as I'm working in the clinic, writing care and um, and also doing research as well. And, and we both see um, individuals across the age span from pediatrics to adults. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jordan Bonshager. I'm the genetic counselor here at the Neuromuscular Center, um, and I support all of our clinics, including the MDA clinic. So, do see patients with SH um, involved on the kind of testing coordination piece of things, gathering family histories, coordinating conversations about testing other family members, etc. So, the genetics resource in our clinic. And I'm Cindy Gibson. I'm an adult nurse practitioner and I work in the clinic, but strictly I do not do active research at this time. Okay. Know the bunch. What questions do we have for them? Well, I can start off with a um, chat question. So, um, first question was what supplements are recommended? <laughs> um, I, I don't know that we have information that kind of supports um, a supplement that, I mean, if there's a, a study with supplements that were done in France, um, whether or not it was helpful, to, 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 the study was not very clear. So I, I don't know that we have any uh, supplements that, that that I would suggest to patients with I'll actually I'll answer part of that question because supplements are really important for our family. Well, just it was a clear study from France. They actually ended it early because it wasn't 
fair mm -hmm. to the people who were on placebo. So I think when you represent the French antioxidant, antioxidant study, let's do it in an unbiased manner. It was so efficacious that those people who were on placebo, i.e. not getting the antioxidants, were taken off of it, placebo and put on the antioxidants. So it was very efficacious. There's no drug company to pay for more studies on supplements. So we won't see a lot of sub supplement studies, but that study was beyond proven. And just to extend that comment, so we there, there is a Facebook group, Camara runs it along with a number of other patients. And there's a lot of people, I think there's about a thousand members now who are benefiting from a community and information sharing out there. We know, what we know is that it's an epigenetic disease. So you have the gene and then we have the environmental factors that affect how the gene operates in the body. And I don't think there would be any disagreement to say that oxidative stress, right? And ROS has a, a, an interaction with DUX4. So ROS turns on DUX4 and DUX4 turns on ROS. That we know from, and there's no disagreement. I think where there's maybe um, question marks is how much can we control with diet, the foods we eat, with exercise and with supplementation to control the amount of ROS. ROS stands for reactive oxygen species. And from there, we can look at all the other studies with all the other disease groups where we actually know very scientifically and very well proven that diet and exercise and supplements can have a very big role and it's emerging. So whereas a few years ago when I was at this conference, we had limited information about which antioxidants worked on mitochondrial ROS versus non-mitochondrial ROS. Now we know we have even more information. We're able to sort of differentiate those factors. So you will not see the kind of rigor that you will with a pharma study, but there's a good reason for that because it's not very often that you hear about someone dying from too much vitamin C or taking too many multivitamins. It's kind of not often, right? So it's not as well studied, but it's not... Again, the risks aren't there as well. I have a question from um, that I get a lot from my physical therapists. Um, so a lot of places aren't as lucky to have expert physical therapists in FSHD like we are here. Um, matter of fact, where I'm from, we, we don't. And so um, people come to me a lot and say, how do I... Um, find First of all, find a physical therapist in my area that knows about FSHD, and if I can't, what should I do to help them understand my disease so that they can help me the best? So the APTA, which is our uh, governing body, the American Physical Therapy Association, does have a, a link on it that says find PT. And so you can put in your address and find a physical therapist. Um, they also have a, a section where you can find a physical therapist that has a specialty. Um, typically a neurocertified specialist has a background in um, neurologic type conditions. It may not be FSHD, but they would be more uh, trained to do function based exercise or engagement in, in physical activities and things like that. And maybe in uh, someone who specializes in orthopedic care where they're doing total knee replacements and that kind of stuff. Um, so that would be a, probably the first place to look. Um, we've also worked with that stage to study to put on a brochure about physical therapy. And so uh, being able to download and take that to a physical therapist and provide resources and thoughts for them to um, you know, kind of guide the, the role of physical therapy in the physical state. Um, so we can also um, serve, you know, both of them I serve very often as a resource for community physical therapists that don't know a lot about FSHD. Um, we see a lot of individuals here with that. And so we can talk with community providers to help them understand the condition and kind of things that they've been looking at and recommending and and um going on. We we typically would always recommend an individualized care plan. So having a physical therapist do an evaluation, understanding what their needs are from the patient perspective, what their role in their daily life is, what kind of things they like to do, um, and then being able to to develop a plan of care that addresses that individual person's needs. Um, so we always kind of say individualized care plan and, and uh, is, is important for a care about this age group. Awesome, thank you. Questions? Uh, 
Heidi, did you have a question? Oh, you know, that was the question I was going to ask. You and me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, how do we get like in contact with you? Like, do you have um? We have your email address. Yes, so we're happy to provide that. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> maybe talk about the benefit. Like our patients love aquatic therapy, and could you maybe talk about the benefits between regular physical therapy and aquatic therapy, and maybe how aquatic therapy is different from like the YMCA in the pool class. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I, I think in general, there's benefits from what we call land-based therapy. So what you do in like the GMAC uh, setting um, versus aquatic therapy. But so I, I still think kind of, I want to piggyback off of what Kate said, and I think every plan should be individualized. So there's no set thing that I could say to you guys right now that's going to be like, everyone's going to benefit from the exercise. It's just not the case. Everyone's different. So aquatic therapy may benefit someone while well, it doesn't benefit someone else. Um, in general, aquatic therapy can offload joints a little bit better. Um, and so if you don't have what's called anti-gravity strength, so if you can't lift above the head that way, in the water you may be able to. And so again, it can promote range of motion and it can just allow you to work on different activities as opposed to always being land-based and always being against gravity. Um, and so I don't know if I fully addressed the question, but I think you know, that is one of the best benefits is that it can offer a less, a position that puts you against gravity less. You know, what's the difference between actual aquatic therapy and like the Zumba class? In the water? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There, I mean, honestly, the stuff that they do at the Y could be great for some people, but aquatic therapy is typically one-on-one uh, -on -one with a therapist in more of a therapeutic pool. So therapeutic pools are kept at warmer temperatures and they're used to promote certain aspects of what water can offer. So buoyancy and things like that. So it's very different. Although the classes at the YMCA can be great and can promote socialization, I think that an independent program with a therapist that's interesting to you is really truly what one therapy is. I have another one, mostly because a lot of this is very personal to me, but um, <laughs> but I also hear, I get a lot of questions from folks, um, this question is from Jordan. Um, what um, options do families have um, if they know that this disease genetically runs in their family, if they're thinking about having children? Yeah, so this has changed even in the last, I think, several years. So. Um, certainly there are, are prenatal, for families that are, are thinking about starting family or not currently pregnant, um, a consultation with the prenatal genetic counselors is something they could consider. Um, prenatal testing is, is likely available. Uh, getting back to childhood versus adult onset piece of things and like taking that off of the table. Um, typically with, with prenatal testing, companies may not do testing of an ongoing pregnancy for what may be a adult onset disorder. Um, and so they're, you know, if the family is interested in testing a pregnancy, they may want to make sure with their counselor that there's a lab that's willing to do that before they go ahead and, and, and start a pregnancy. Um, so that would be like a prenatal testing option, um, testing either chorionic villi or testing in, via amniocentesis to actually look at the genetic makeup of that. Um, there are now more options for pre-implantation genetic testing, which is done when a family pursues a pregnancy via IVF. So testing an actual embryo before it's implanted to see whether it has the genetic, um, the genetic defect that causes FSH or not. Um, so that is an option now. Um, there are many limitations on that in that there needs to be testing in the affected parent. There needs to be testing in an affected parent of that person who is going to be pregnant. So they have to have an affected parent who's had confirmed genetic testing. Um, and then there needs to be at least one sample given from the, the probiotics of the person that is, is going to be pregnant um, and a parent, whether it's the affected or unaffected parent. And that's just technically because they do the, the testing via linkage analysis. So they need family members. Um, so there can be limitations to that in terms of 
you may ha not have a genetic test report for your parent. Um, you also may not be able to get a sample from a parent if your parents are deceased or you have uh, a family situation in which that's not, not a possibility for you. Um, so you do have to kind of meet all those parameters. And then even with that, there's a, only about a 90, only, but about a 90% accuracy rate. So there's still a 10% chance that if you go through that process and you do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis that you could have a, a false negative so that the, the child or the individual could be affected even though the prenatal testing was negative. So there's a higher than normal um, possibility of a false negative. So this is a long way to answer to your question, but there are prenatal testing options. There are pre-implantation genetic testing options. And then certainly there are options to test uh, a child or an adolescent if symptoms arise or if a family is motivated to do so once they're born. Are any of these tests covered by insurance? Depends on the insurance company. Um, I think it's really um, dependent on the payer. Um, so there are scenarios where an insurance company might pay for everything. And then there are, are plenty of scenarios where they'll pay for a small amount or maybe won't pay for any of it. So uh, the genetic testing for FSH, as many of you know, is can be really prohibitive and difficult to get. Um, and so that is a, another huge limiting factor for, for many families. Which is why the studies that the New York Department State Department are doing are really important to understand what the economic impact are of having this disease and the prevalence. Um, because without that, insurance companies don't understand, you know, what the true cost of living with the disease is. And so they, I think they'd be more inclined to cover something like this if, you know, if they knew the impact. So thank you, Shannon, for the work you're doing. <laughs> Other questions? I have one. Okay. Well, a big one I get from a lot of patients is, so there's no current treatment for FSHD. Why should I go see a neurologist or an NMD clinic? What good are you, Ruby? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, um, you know, depending where somebody is with, with their FSH, I mean, depending on the severity of it, if it's progressing rapidly or if it's slow. Um, again, I, I, I think in in this time when there's a lot of potential options that are going to come up and you know as far as even if the patients are interested in clinical trials uh, they should come and see you on a regular basis because i mean when we start when they come to us our companies come to us for a clinical trial you know you go to your uh, list and you know the patients that you've seen recently are more, the ones that you're going to call first um, so that's part of it. But the other part is, uh, uh, you know, if there are changes physically and, you know, it's, it, it is very important for them to come and see what they can do. I mean, getting an expert opinion from, you know, experience physically. So, um, so I, I, you know, in, for most patients with FSH, it's uh, the visit of one year is reasonable. Once a year, um, in, in some others, you know, if they're having problems, then they have to see a little I think something else that we all offer, in particular with the multidisciplinary clinic, is we can just help optimize overall health and wellness with understanding the condition of FSHD in the background. And, and so, whether that be how you're dealing with other conditions, comorbid conditions, and things like that, we understand. The impact that FSHD has, um, other than than what maybe a general practitioner may wouldn't be able to offer. Bruce has a question. That is one of the most frustrating parts of having a disease like this. Uh, a lot of people who ask you, you know, are you, are you under the care of a doctor, a neurologist, or anything? It's like you don't care for what? You can't treat them. Um, you can see a neurologist, like a neurologist, they look at a baseline or whatever. So, okay, what else? Same thing with physical therapy, I found, or working with a trainer. A lot of times, because insurance will only cover so much, then they need to see improvement before the insurance company says, well, if there's no improvement, 
you know, sorry, we're not going to cover it. You know, we did you 20 sessions or whatever it is. So, uh, you know, I've been to trainers or therapists, you know, what they do. So, again, it's a very frustrating part of it. It's like the doctors, they can't do anything. They will they test you, okay, give you an EMG. Okay, tell them, okay, you got to say each day. So, I knew that. I found out the Kemp neurologist, though, write a prescription for physical therapy that it helps maintain or not there so they don't look for improvements. But I we found that the neurologist prescription overrides the whole insurance thing. You have to see improvement. I think the, the PT can normally go off of what the doctor is asking for. Yeah. Right? Am I wrong? I think we can help support the fact that it's a chronic progressive condition right. and maintenance is a win. Um, and so providing you know, ways of documenting that and being creative. That being said, I, I also wouldn't necessarily say that ongoing physical therapy is necessary. Mm -hmm. um, there are times that you need a about a physical therapy to address a change in function or a change in, um, you know, following an injury or something like that. And and the more important thing is to have a relationship with a physical therapist that under knows, understands your condition that you can, you know, call up and say, hey, this is changing. You know, can I come see you again? And then we have, a, you know, you do a couple of visits, you get things stabilized again, and then the person's able to continue an exercise program or physical activity independently on their own. And then again, being able to touch base back with a physical therapist that understands and, and can intermittently help you manage your condition for the long term. Okay. I think too the benefit of going to like one of a one of our neuromuscular clinics like it has a multidisciplinary approach. You see all these people, right? You have questions about genetics. Jordan will come in. You have questions about PT. Nicole or Kate will come in. You know, you'll meet with Cindy and Deb, who are excellent, you know, well-informed nurse practitioners. You know, who can answer many questions and, and help with a lot of things. So I think you have this ongoing, long-term relationship, which I know several of you do have in this. Rooms, but we can attest to that as well. But um, you know, I, I'm I'm on the research part. I'm not on the clinic side of it, but I'm in awe of all that they can do for their patients and being able to address concerns of like, I need a ramp for my house, or I need a wheelchair now, or you know, what can we do? And they can help provide guidance of like, where do you find abdominal binder? Like, I get all these questions too from research patients, and then I'm like, well, let's talk to the clinicians, you know. So. There's a new, there's sort of a psychological factor to as things progress, as you get older, um, certain fears, losing the balance, fears of open spaces, right? Even if you have a support device or something. Um, but, you know, one thing I was saying was for the psychological, right? Some sort of hypnosis, you know, because you don't want to take those extra steps or something. And you become sort of paralyzed psychologically of what you can and can't do. What is the suggestion for ongoing exercise for for episode? I mean, a few years ago, nobody knew and kind of sort of out there, maybe it's not so good to exercise, you know, no, backwards and No, forwards. actually, I mean there there's no evidence that it's bad for it's actually, I mean, all of the um, studies that, that had exercise and that, that look at exercise in FSH3 were positive. And like um, what kind? Aerobic, resistance? Um, yeah, yeah, both. And, and I, I think, you know, it's just you have to be careful about certain things. I mean, you don't want to, if you have scapular winging, um, but your deltoid is good and your biceps is good. You can train those, but you have to have your back supported. Mm -hmm. These are little, little things, you know. You know, people who have expertise in this in, in this patient population can give. And I think this is again coming back to your question. That's why I mean, you, you get much more benefit and feedback from uh, you know individuals, us, and you know, physical therapists who've seen a lot of patients like you. I just wanted to circle back why seeing a specialist um, is a minor point, but I've run into it. So our 
position in Hippocratic Oath um, a provider of Hippocratic Oath includes do not harm. And that sometimes played a role too. So for example, I had a patient who had as a first symptom hypochromia, which means you know, par weak paraspinal muscles, she was moving forward and went through that. So what do at the time it was sensation? So we diagnosed her that that was her symptom. But you know, an orthopedic surgeon suggested to put a rod into her spine to get it upright. And uh, we suggested that because you know, her spinal muscle was weak and that wouldn't have helped her. And so we had other strategies for her. But just as a you know, it's an anecdote, but just to mention, sometimes it helps to have a specialist team guide other health issues and, and um, navigate the health system and recommendations also with the goal not to harm. Yeah, but, uh, yeah let me expand on that a little bit. That, that's it. Um, yeah, I mean, these are things that we face often. And, and I think the reason we're here, other than you know taking care of patients with SSH, trying to kind of avoid interventions that are you know, like that without our opinion uh, from individuals, you know, um, Physicians who are not familiar with the same thing comes up with scapular fixation. Um, yes, it can be helpful in certain situations, but you know, it, there, there are you know also minuses for that. I mean, it depends what what you're doing for. Uh, it's limiting if you do it, but for a lot of patients, it's important and it gets done. It can benefit, but you you have to. You have to know that in advance. You know, if you go to a surgeon, they'll not ask any questions, they'll just do it. Um, so getting opinions, you know, from people who've seen patients who've had it, who've had good responses, bad responses, um, you know, this is what we can provide. Yes. Just wanted to yeah. say, um, we are full-time RVers. We no longer live officially in Rochester. We live in a 34-foot travel trailer. <laughs> um, we come back once a year to go to a myriad of doctors, dentists, eyeglass, et cetera, and see the grandchildren. And um, coming back to see you, hi, Katie, <laughs> um, once a year is, uh, this is the one with the SSHD. Um, it's just a confirmation that we're doing, checking in on the right things. And if there is something that we've just ignored in our day-to-day -day lives um, that somebody else may pick up on it or, or give us a script to get a, a walker or, or what, whatever it is to make us, it make it possible for us to continue this life. Um, and, and having that, you all know, you know our records going back, you got all the stuff. So it's not trying to explain to somebody on the road. And we uh, we had to sign up for health insurance again in October, we considered because it's cheaper to without taxes to have, have residences and um, or domicile addresses in South Dakota, Florida, or Texas. Um, and we voted not to, and largely because we talked to uh, our insurance agent, and he said, if you have need something of care, if you need uh, knee replacement or you need whatever, would you take care of it on the road or would you go back to Rochester? And I, without hesitation, we'd come back to Rochester no matter where we were. Rochester's only a, a plane ride away. Um, the rig can be parked, the cat can travel with us. Um, go where we know the hospital, we know the people, we, they have our records. Um, that's worth so much more than having to do a, do a flight. And, and that's all, so we maintain our address here. It's my daughter's house, but don't tell. <laughs> um, and so we can have our MVP at life and ins health insurance and, and have the security of knowing we're not just walking into any place um, unless it's an emergency and then it's an emergency, so you deal. But that's also why you go every year and, and you maintain the relationship. Scott says so too. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's not the OG in the SHD here, so <laughs> she's the OG. <laughs> yes, blood work. 
So what are you looking at in terms of routine blood work, particularly on, in terms of a hormone panel? Um, we don't, unless somebody has symptoms that suggest them. Because there's a lot of emerging research on the relationship with Ross reactive oxygen species and communication with the hypothalamus and testosterone production. And considering that we know how precipitously men with FSHD tend to decline and that testosterone production is related to muscle mass and they've got a muscle wasting disease, wouldn't it be wise to start using a, a hormone panel more regularly for the patient population? Um, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that question. You know, um, and I would not know at what point. I mean, somebody who's, who's more expert on that could give me an answer. I mean, I don't. You know, if somebody's symptomatic, definitely. Um, if there are signs of, of um, I mean, this is a, a question to a to a, to your internist. Say, you know, do I need to get tested? Um, I, you know, there, there's no literature to tell me that what I need to do as far as testing, hormonal testing, is something that I So I'm, I'm, I'll send you the literature. It's on PubMed. It's so much new has come out in terms of ROS and testosterone. It's and especially in the past three years, it's been explosive. What I see, because unfortunately I'm in the position where patients send me their lab work, and so I've seen hundreds and hundreds, is that you've got a lot of particularly male patients with FSH who are borderline low end, even in their 20s, right? And so we already have a decline in muscle tissue, right? Wouldn't it make sense to just start, you know, as this is an FSH center, let's start collecting that data, let's start making sure that we're on top of hormones and then possibly exploring what does it mean to make sure that particularly men with FSH are, you know, taking exogenous testosterone to the extent they need to, to stay in a good reference range. It's funny you say that to because I've heard so many women say that they saw disease progression, say, after they had a child. Fully. Yeah. And um, so I'm bringing up men now because to, to be honest with you, it's low hanging fruit. It's not a question for me. Like I, all I'm doing is pushing people back to their doctors, redo your hormone uh, panel, show your doctor a couple of months, have the discussion. There are so many people who, for whatever reason, because I'm like a strange woman on the internet, will come to me and talk to me about their or their husband's erectile dysfunction, but they won't have it with their doctor. So I'm putting this all also to the panel that maybe instead of waiting for people to come to you with symptoms, it's one of those. So let's talk about something a little bit uncomfortable and kind of you know, make it a, a comfortable, a safe place to have that conversation, right? So that we can help patients. But I, I suspect also for women, low amounts of tea, right? Like much lower. I'm not talking about 50 milligrams. I'm talking about like four, seven milligrams might be in the range of what we're looking for women in the patient population. But there is a strong relationship now that we know about with with Ross and hormones, that it it really merits and menopause too. I've heard that too when women yes. have the menopausal age that they hundred percent. And I, I've also noticed in your side because I've been saying this for years. My first, I I I had it as a child. Now that now I know, I remember everything back to my childhood, the winking scapula, everything. But um, when I got pregnant with my first child. That's when the foot dropped. Mm -hmm. And I was fine. And then I got pregnant with the second child and my right quadricep went. And I just said to Beth, because I saw your slide, that the kids, you looked at the ages, and in girls it was 12 and a half, and in boys it was 15. Yeah. Are those slides or not? No. Um, yeah. There was Natalie. There was Natalie. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. And, and sorry. <laughs> and I said to Beth, like, it's hormones. I mean, hormones play an act for so long. I've even said to you, like, where are the trials on hormones? Yeah. Because I swear by it. And menopause, a hundred percent. And that's why, I mean, I don't know. Is there any data that like all older women around like menopause age start seeing worsening than men? Because men don't get, I mean, I just hear it. Men don't get <laughs> menopause. The so problem I'm wondering is that like, women... how... <laughs> They get secondary diagnoses, what are not really secondary. So like 
you get comorbidities, things like arthritis, right? So is it, I mean, arthritis is a wearing out of cartilage for sure, but is the arthritis the primary or is it the FSH? The FSH is the primary because if you had a strong muscular skeletal system, right? Then you'd have, you'd have the support around the joints that the cartilage wouldn't wear as much, right? But so then it's like, well, is it arthritis or if is, is it FSH? And it muddies all this data. That's why I would love to see centers like this one, what, you know, people have this relationship with, right? The, their FSH sent team, that's their team, right? Is going to be a bit more proactive on the blood work and just doing that intuitive listening to the patient population so that we can offer the full set of what's in the toolkit, right? Even if it's not something that is as well published yet, because it can that can be part of the opportunity for this team is to become the people who publish. We have one uh, little advertisement yeah. here. Um, if you are a member of the National Registry, watch out because we have a survey coming on um, effects of menstrual and sexual health and women with FSHD and it's uh, about the IRB submitted and then it will go out later this year so if you see something circling around I know there are a lot of emails but for the women here um, please uh, consider um, taking that survey because it's uh, uh, addressing questions or it's asking questions that to our knowledge haven't been asked so and then Chad Heapel just did a study on human growth hormone and yeah. testosterone, right? So, yeah. Hello? That was that was that was like a good start. I think this is where an interdisciplinary approach could have could have helped because he had the dosage. Um, he was doing subcutaneous injections of growth hormone daily, which is right. But then he was doing biweekly um, IM injections of testosterone, and the problem with biweekly. Um, I am injections of testosterone is that it's not very well absorbed and it takes a long time, longer than the, the trial went on for men to actually appreciate the testosterone coming into their system. And if they had done also daily subcutaneous testosterone or even the testosterone gel, they would have seen a stronger outcome in that trial. And it's just, it's just about a, a more encompassing interdisciplinary approach, right? And getting everybody out of their silo. And, and Jade, I know the other <laughs> society funded that, right? I spoke to Dan and it was originally proposed in 2014, correct? It took a while to, to kind of get out and I know the results are posted. On it's Starfish, I had it on the screen. Okay, start, okay. Starfish. It was an open label. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, thank you team for being our panel on the panel today. Um, lunch and so we're going to take a quick uh looks like 30 some odd minute lunch break um you can grab your lunch on the table there was one person that wanted a special needed a special meal and your name is box and i'll just say that that's what um yeah. really so we, we're gonna have lunch in the next room oh. over so so when we go out um so we're gonna go into the take a right <laughs> great thank you okay and we'll be back here at 1 20 and then we'll start back up again Okay. to get started oh thank you is my online audience back are they back i hope everybody had a good lunch what was in the refrigerator chicken soup or whatever <laughs> boiled eggs i don't know <laughs> hope everyone here had a nice lunch i am very full um my next guest needs no introduction do you guys watch david letterman we have a show on Netflix called My Next Guest Needs No Introduction. But I am so proud and happy to say that Dr. John Sheet Arjaman, our chief science officer, is with us here today. And he's going to speak about clinical trial readiness in FSHD. Dr. Arjaman? Thank you for inviting me. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yesterday I had the pleasure of meeting with the uh, uh, CTRN team uh, at, at Rochester. and. Learn a little bit more about what they're doing, which uh, we were always in constant communication with them anyway, but it's always good to catch up face to face with them. So, how do I advance my slides? I guess. Yeah. Ah, okay. Thank you. There we go. So, um, today, what I thought I would chat about is a drug development process and uh, clinical trials, but uh, 
Dr. Hamill already kind of covered a lot of what I'm going to say. So it's going to be a refresher for you guys. And uh, we'll have a short test afterwards. To see that. <laughs> and also, I wanted to uh, um, another activity kind of highlighting what the FSHG Society is doing is uh, trying to identify gaps in clinical trial readiness and uh, figuring out ways of how we can solve them uh, uh, in, in a collaborative manner. And so that's what I'll try to highlight. Um, so the drug development process is always shown in a very kind of straightforward uh, arrow of uh, kind of these chevrons that, you know, you start with research and it goes into clinical work and then you have the clinical stuff. And it's, it's very nice and clean. This is actually taken from our uh, website, but the process is actually a little bit more complicated and there's a lot of ups and downs to it. And uh, every single stage of drug development has its own issues and they're quite often very unique to the drug itself that's being developed. So um, this is where you know, we identify the, the gap in clinical trial readiness. Like what are the, the issues that come up that need to be resolved that are common enough to all the drugs that would benefit if there was a collaborative way of approaching them. So what I thought here I would do is kind of highlight what each of these steps are. I'm gonna have to put on my glasses so I can see. But you know, the you know, all, all drug discovery really starts with basic research and basic understanding of FSHD's um, disease mechanism. So until we knew that DUPS4 was the culprit, it was really tough to develop drugs against it, right? So um, once there's a, uh, the mechanism is known, you know, companies or uh, researchers can try to figure out how they're going to tackle and try to develop drugs. What is their point of entry? And so once they do this, uh, they kind of have a candidate drug. Uh, they usually start testing it, and they you know they have to formulate it and uh, manufacture it to make sure that it's going to be stable. So that's the formulation development. The next step is they start doing a lot of uh, toxicity studies and animal models, and um, so you can try to see how it, the drug is being distributed, and um, you know long exposure, toxicity in animal models. So all of this is called preclinical. These are things that happen uh, to develop a drug candidate, but then we can show these data to regulatory agencies and get permission if all of these things pass and they are shown to be safe. Uh, you can then uh, enter the clinical trial and test them in humans for the first time. So as we heard, and I'll go in a little more detail, but uh, phase one typically is very short-term safety. So one dose, maybe two doses, short term. Um, phase two is also safety as a main concern, and you're testing it in patients for maybe uh, longer period of times at the dose that you think it's going to be effective. And this is really an opportunity during phase two to test a lot of outcome measures to see what are the metrics that you can measure where a drug is going to be effective. And then if that passes, uh, then you enter the phase three, clinical study, that's when you're testing effectiveness of the drug, as well as monitoring safety. And uh, if all goes well, then um, uh, you know, the results are then shared with the FDA and the regulatory agencies would determine whether they approve the drug or not. Um, but um, uh, just focusing a little bit on the clinical end of it. So um, what this slide here is trying to illustrate is that there is, um, um, you know, the number of participants needed and the costs that associated with clinical trials, every phase of it kind of increases at every step. So in phase one, um, phase one could be done in healthy volunteers and it's usually, you know, it can be a, a 10, 20, maybe 30 volunteers that are tested at, for short periods of time. So there's a certain cost associated with that. In the phase two, if you're having a anywhere from 30 to 80 patients or maybe more of up to 100, and it's going to be a longer period of, of time, probably the duration of uh, what they anticipate the clinical trial duration will be uh, maybe 48 weeks, you know, as the fulcrum study or up to a year. And, um, uh, and here they're going to be testing a lot of possible endpoints. And so, you know, the demand on the participants is going to be a little bit, might be a little bit higher. You might be asked to go in and do all these tests, give muscle biopsies, um, sit in the scanner for a while, 
Um, so that might be a, a demanding time commitment, but all of these results are very important because whatever seems to show and track with the disease and show that, uh, that the drug may have an effect on the disease, those are usually adapted in a phase three trial, which will have probably the most number of participants. And, um, but the, hopefully the uh, protocol or what's being asked of the patients to participate in is gonna be a little bit less demanding, more focused. Um, so, but the cost and the, the you know, um, and the number of participants keeps increasing with every phase. And so uh, if there is not enough data to warrant going from phase one to phase two, usually those companies will abandon the program or shelf it. Um, so there needs to be a really good compelling reason to go to the next one. And of course, we touched on this in the previous discussions. Uh, after a drug is approved, uh, there is always post-marketing um, tracking because the testing in all of these clinical stages, one, two, three, it's pretty narrow uh, patient population volunteers that are being tested. But once it's out in the general population and you may have comorbidities with other diseases, you don't know how your drug might be interacting with maybe heart medication that people take commonly. So that's where this phase four kind of comes in. Um, so I wanted to touch on the type of clinical studies, and I think we've touched on this, Dr. Kowal mentioned earlier, uh, there are two types of uh, experiments that are being done with volunteers, and there are the observational or the natural history studies and um, University of Rochester patient registry, which is a, a, a survey that's sent out annually, as well as all of the more clinical-based studies like the Resolve, Move and Move Plus that we're gonna hear about. Those are observational studies where they really, really critical. This is where they, um, they're testing and, and tracking the progression, natural progression of the disease in uh, a pretty large group of, of volunteers. And they're also testing a lot of um, assays or measurements uh, that can be used in clinical trials. So that becomes very critical. This is kind of how you can validate that the instrument is tracking uh, the progression of the disease. And those are the type of instruments that get used in the interventional trials, which are listed down below. Now, I updated the slide because a couple months ago, um, Fulcrum's REACH trial was, uh, 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 the, uh, that was the only one that was active. And since then, in the last couple of months, uh, both Avidity and Roche have launched their trials. So this is a very exciting time in the field. Uh, there are more uh, companies that are getting ready to start clinical trials. So this field, this area is gonna fill up with more and more names and companies, very exciting. One of the concerns that we have is, will there be enough volunteers to come forward and participate in all of them. The other one is, will the existing sites, I mean, we just heard from Dr. Tawil, there are 23 existing CTRN sites, but will they have the capacity to run all of these different trials simultaneously? And um, so that's something that we're keeping an eye out with and, and chatting with the CTRN to see how maybe additional sites could be added on. Um, so every single trial that's done is informative. And, um, you know, we heard that actually during lunch, I was uh, chatting about uh, the Acceleron trial. Uh, the Acceleron trial was uh, um, done was about two years ago. Uh, this was a myostatin inhibitor, kind of similar to what Roche is doing. Um, they uh, ran their trial for six months and they saw a pretty remarkable 14% muscle growth where they were injecting their drug. However, they were also tracking uh, disease progression by running some tests and the placebo group, the group that wasn't receiving the drug was also improving just like the group that was getting the drug. So there was a learning effect that they didn't account for. And as the placebo group was getting better, eventually by around five months, it looked like they were leveling off and the drug group was continuing to improve. Unfortunately, they had designed their study for a six month trial and everybody's double blinded. So when the trial ends, that's when they collect the data and they can analyze it. So they didn't have the option to extend it beyond that. And as I mentioned, trials are quite expensive. Acceleron didn't have the capacity to repeat, the ex repeat that experiment for a 12 month study. And so that program was shelved. Uh, Acceleron now has been purchased by Merck. We'll see if Merck is willing to 
reopen that line of study and maybe design a new trial around that. But what's been really important from this Acceleron trial was that six months might not be long enough. So all of the subsequent trials are being designed now are about a year long, which has been really helpful to the field. So there's always lessons to be learned. And even when a trial fails, it's not, there's so many lessons that can be applied for subsequent trials. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention is that clinical trials are experiments. They're controlled scientific mm -hmm. experiments. And uh, what these experiments try to do is control and minimize the sources of variabilities. And so I wanted to highlight, you know, what are some of the sources of variability in a study? Uh, in a preclinical stage, when you're testing in animals, rats and mice are genetically identical. They're all inbred. They are all housed the same. They eat the same food. The lights turn on and turn off at exactly the same time. Uh, so you have a very controlled environment and you can see an effect that you know, is robust. Once you start testing the drug in people, everybody's a little bit different. We all have different habits. We sleep different amounts. We eat different foods. Uh, so people have just normal variations. Plus to add to that, the disease itself, FSHD is quite variable amongst individuals, amongst family members, it's asymmetrical. Uh, so that also poses a challenge. And then there is the accuracy of the measurements, the tests. So every test that's being used, uh, there is a plus or minus, there is, a, there is some variability in how the test is administered. And actually, one of the things that University of Rochester does is they try to standardize those tests and train everybody. So uh, Kate's team here really sets up the protocol and all of the training for all of the CTRN sites. So they are all testing the exact same way to really minimize that any sort of variability with the testing and the, uh, that there is no difference in the size. And then finally, another source of variability is the drug itself. We don't know how effectively the drug is metabolized. And quite often people metabolize drugs differently. So somebody taking a particular dose may break it down a lot faster. They have less, ex less exposure to the drug. Other people may be slow metabolizers, and so they get a longer exposure to the drug. Those are things that we don't know. But that's why uh, the controlled scientific experiment, usually the protocol will have some levels of inclusion and exclusions to try to really select a narrow group of volunteers that will be as close, sim very similar to each other to minimize some of this variability. And some examples for like inclusion will be to uh, recruit adults. So why adults? Why not, uh, why not include kids? Well, kids are growing and they're adding muscle mass, which is a confound when you're trying to test to see if a drug is uh, preventing muscle loss. Um, um, you need to have some level of disease manifestation because otherwise there's nothing to measure. If everybody can walk and run just fine, then you wouldn't be able to do a walking type of measure. There is no deficit there. And quite often genetic confirmation is required as an inclusion criteria. And that's because there's about 300 different neuromuscular diseases out there. And um, some of them are quite similar to each other. And even, you know, except for expert clinicians like Dr. Tawil and his team, there are neurologists that may only see an FSHU patients once or twice in their career, and they might have a hard time diagnosing it, and they may be, may be uh, identifying the uh, you know, clinical diagnosis may not be accurate. So this is why a lot of uh, trials require genetic confirmation. Now, as far as exclusion criteria, those could be comorbidities. We've talked about, you know, they're trying to minimize that. Um, uh, somebody being pregnant or nursing, they could be excluded. Um, and then if they cannot perform certain tests, so let's say if you're testing for walking ability and somebody does not have mobility, they may be excluded for that particular, particular test. Um, so far, I think the inclusion exclusion criteria for most of the trials have been uh, pretty fairly broad. Um, and we'll see how the next set of uh, trials, uh, what, what they determine. Shade, I'll just add that I think <laughs> the therapies come into the trial programs. Those therapies will have different inclusion exclusion criteria. For example, if the patient has been previously treated with a cell or gene therapy or an RNAi, RNAi therapeutic, you're unlikely to be able to participate in the gene therapy trial. Yeah. Absolutely. It's going to be 
very drug specific and they're all going to have to have their own um, inclusion and exclusion to try to minimize risk and adverse things. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so what is the role of the regulatory agencies in all of this? You know, we, you know, it seems like the FDAs might be, people see it as a roadblock. You know, their primary concern is, uh, you know, safety, safety of the participants and safety of the drug being developed. And so all of the regulatory agencies provide advisory roles to the pharmaceutical companies that are developing the drugs. Uh, they're very concerned about safety. Uh, to approve a drug, they're looking to see that the drug is effective. So it's got to be clinically meaningful to the patient community, and the benefits need to really outweigh the risk. So if you're looking at a drug, let's say in oncology, where uh, cancer tumor expansion will kill the patient, you might be able, the FDA will accept higher levels of risk. So a lot of the oncology drugs, chemotherapy drugs, uh, make pa patients sick. You know, they lose their hair and stuff, but uh, it treats the tumor. And that's uh, a risk benefit ratio uh, is calculated. And it's, it's, you know, if you don't get the drug, the tumors will spread and kill you. However, um, uh, you would not accept ke chemotherapy agent, let's say for hair, uh, that would not be accepted. Um, anyway. So, and then um, the other thing that is quite interesting is the regulatory agencies actually want to hear uh, from the patient community when they're making these decisions. And uh, for instance, a couple of years ago, and I'll touch on this in a few minutes, um, they told us that they really want to hear directly from the patients of how the disease is affecting their quality of life and what kind of uh, treatments they're looking for. And this is uh, where they draw a lot of their expertise. So we organized uh, a voice of the patient meeting and uh, you, and I don't know how many of you participated, but we had a tremendous um, number of people show up, about 400 people show up on the day of the meeting virtually, as well as giving testimonies. And that became a document that we shared uh, with the FDA. And so now it forms the basis of their knowledge about what the community wants in a, in a therapeutic. And obviously, you know, they're involved in the approval of drugs. So, um, you know, how can, you know, you as a community enhance the drug development process is, you know, we've talked about this in the previous session, be known to your local clinic and us, we can provide some information on trials, but you're the clinicians that you see here at Rochester, they have a lot of information. They're involved in all the trials. Uh, be prepared. So, you know, if you know the most common Inclusion criteria might be, you know, to have a genetic test, if it's possible to get genetically tested and have that ready, that's, that's great. Um, get the best care available, uh, and, you know, be as healthy as possible all along. So if things change and you uh, get a visit, uh, you have a chance to visit with your PT and make the adjustments so you can live better, absolutely do that. That staying healthy is very important. And if you don't qualify for, let's say, a clinical trial, please participate in the natural history studies. There are so much that we still are learning about the disease. So, for instance, uh, we have heard about uh, the MD Starnets, uh, the, the retrospective studies they are doing. Uh, in 2020, they published a study where they were looking at the cause of death uh, in different muscular dystrophies. And over 50% of FSHD patients, the cause of death was attributed to pulmonary issues. Now, that's a very broad category, um, but it was kind of surprising. So do we need to do more research on uh, pulmonary function and respiratory We know that there are patients, uh, especially um, uh, who require CPAP and uh, um, uh, respiratory aids, um, but we probably don't know a whole lot uh, and we need to have additional studies in that space. Uh, and then participate in surveys. Uh, we send out a bunch of surveys on behalf of companies, on, on behalf of the research community. Uh, so getting input from uh, people from different, uh, different stages of uh, their journey, as well as um, um, different geographical regions, this becomes really important. So thank you for all of you who, who participated in this. And the last thing is, you know, stay informed. Uh, please sign up on our website if you haven't already done so to get these regular updates on, uh, uh, on trials. So um, accelerating drug development, like uh, five minutes. Oh, okay. All right. 
Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, it starts with basic research, a lot of the drug development. This is where historically the society has funded a lot of academic basic research. Um, the drugs are kind of proprietary to the company, so we don't really do anything in that space. However, the common gaps that we've identified is usually the instrumentation, the tests that are being developed, like biomarkers, um, the, the infrastructure, the clinical infrastructure, like the CTRN. This is quite important for um, and in drug development. And then also getting the volunteers, patient volunteers, you informed about what's happening. And this is what we've really started focusing on on trying to um, accelerate drug development. So uh, to kind of get a better sense of what was happening, uh, we, in 2019, we held our first industry collaborative meeting. I think Dr. Tawil was there. Uh, we invited all the companies that we knew either had existing programs or were familiar or were interested in FSHD, as well as the regulatory agencies. And we were trying to really grow the field and uh, let other pharma companies know that uh, FSHD is a tractable indication. We know enough about it that you should be trying to develop drugs for it. And then part of that meeting is we are trying to identify the, the gap, the things that everybody's going to need to advance their drugs. And these are not surprising. Uh, I think Dr. Tulu uh, already mentioned some of these. We need biomarkers of the disease, whether they are bloodborne or they are muscle biopsies, we need better biomarkers. We need more information about imaging. Uh, we need uh, standardized outcome measures that can be done, used in a clinical trial. Uh, at the time, I think the network only had, uh, CTRN only had eight sites. So we knew that for more clinical trials, we would need additional sites. And then we also, uh, FDA told us they wanted to hear about the, uh, directly from the patients. Um, we needed to learn more about the natural history and um, genetic testing was always a, a, a challenge. And so those were the gaps that were identified. And of course, our main interest was also to make sure that were more and more companies entering the field. Um, so very quickly, you know, some of the things that we did over the span of the last couple of years has been, um, you know, we launched a couple of uh, blood biomarker studies. We actually got samples. Uh, they contributed some samples. Unfortunately, our studies didn't pan out, uh, but those were some studies that we could do during the pandemic. Um, natural history studies, we actually funded some uh, artificial intelligence studies to kind of mine existing registry data to learn more about it. And these are uh, some studies that are still ongoing. Um, we mentioned, I already mentioned this voice of the patient meeting for the FDA, we did that. And now we are conducting some health economic studies, try to uh, quantify what the overall lifetime cost of living with FSHD is, because as soon as drugs are approved, insurance companies are gonna need those metrics to kind of approve reimbursement of the drugs. So this is something that we're starting to do now. And then we did some uh, you know, joint funded initiatives. So you know, we helped expand the CTRN with four additional sites. And now a lot of other groups have uh, chipped in and that's how the network has grown to have 23 sites, which is really amazing. Um, we, uh, whoops, okay, let me just put all of these, whoops, all of these up. Um, so we, uh, and, and with co-funding from pharmaceutical companies, we launched a genetic testing program. So um, people would be qualified to enter clinical trials and have a clinically approved uh, genetic diagnosis. And what we're looking to do going forward is create this alliance with industry to tackle the bigger gaps. So things that we cannot fund our, on our own, it would be too expensive for any one company maybe to fund. And so by pooling and getting the uh, pharmaceuticals to join forces, we're hoping that we can uh, put more resources in a very focused manner and really uh, accelerate uh, their solutions. And ultimately it would be great to get the government to back fund some of these things. So getting this public private partnership with funding from NIH would be really fantastic. So just coming back to how the field has changed and this is my last minute here. Um, when I started in 2019, there were four companies with active FSHD uh, programs that I was aware of. Within a year, three of them dropped out. We were down to one company. Ocrum was the only one that was left standing. Um, this is really kind of a revolving door. As companies drop out for various reasons, others see an opportunity and they enter. We now can count over 20 companies that are in the space. 
And some of the companies are bigger companies. Some of them are very small startups, but they're all looking to develop a therapeutic. And then we get wonderful news. Like for instance, a small startup, Miracule, uh, started a program. We uh, helped support them and friends of FSH also provide funding to them. And they got their program to a level and now a major pharmaceutical company like Sanofi is backing them up. And so now they have a joint program uh, with Sanofi. Or you hear about very innovative companies like Vita Therapeutics that were able to raise you know, something like $30 million uh, for in a, uh, in a Series B, and they're developing stem cell therapies for FSH. So very exciting times. Um, and, and I think we've already heard from Dr. Hamill that there are three existing trials. And I put down here the clinical trial website uh, link down below. Uh, clinicaltrials.gov is where you can find information on uh, these existing trials, but there's three active uh, trials happening right now. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions or let the next speaker come because we might be late. <laughs> Any questions for Jamshid? So what happens in a phase two clinical trial? Anyone? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free, uh, feel free to come to me during the break sometime. Thank you. Right on time too. <laughs> All right. Um, now we'd like to get our clinical trial team up here. Ravi, Leanne, Jordan, I don't know. Are you gonna speak and then they can Okay. <laughs> Hello, I'm Leanne Lewis. Um, if you haven't already met me, I am Dr. Ravi Will's um, main research coordinator. So. Um, I've probably seen you if you've participated in any of our research trials in the last seven years. Um, so we have talked a lot about clinical trials and what are they and what's coming up. And so a lot of questions that I get on my end are, how do I get in them? What are all the behind the scenes kinds of things that I need to know? How do I get on the list? All those kinds of questions. So I'm hoping to address that today. So where do you even start? Um, the first and best place to start is with your local sites. Um, but then it's like, okay, well, where is even my local site? So we have started up the FSHC Clinical Trial Research Network several years ago. And uh, we have a network of sites that are again, trained um, so that they can implement FSHC trials and other studies. Um, so they have the proper equipment and the proper people um, who are familiar with FSHC. So, Finding one of those sites, um, we have a website for that as well, um, where it lists all the sites. Um, but then hopefully you will know someone that's local to you as well, or you can contact your neurologist and try to find out um, a site that's local to you as well. But, but contacting a site and knowing who to talk to first is the best way to um, to get your foot in the door. So um, the, the next best thing to do is talk to your neurologist who will know about the different clinical trials, who will be able to refer you um, to another site that they might know about that might be participating. Because not necessarily all um, sites participate in all of the sites. Um, at Rochester, we do, um, but you know they can usually refer you because again, we've established this network so that they're aware um, of who's doing what. And then um, keeping up to date on your own. Um, I know this can be hard sometimes, but again, as, um, as Jim should just me mention clinicaltrials.gov, um, and then um, Dr. Campbell also had that as well in her slide about how to find um, FSHD clinical trials. That's a great way to just check there periodically. Um, I would highly recommend the FSHD Society. This is totally an unsolicited uh, um, plug, but really they've done an excellent job of providing a lot of information on their website and their newsletters and their emails about what's coming out um, and, and what's to come and, and, and all of that. So um, I would highly suggest, you know, going to their website every so often and looking at their clinical trials page, and that will give you more information. And then also I've had some more technically, technically savvy uh, patients tell me about Google alerts. 
don't ask me how to do this. I just can't figure it out. But apparently you can um, set up Google Alerts to alert you about um, information about you know published um, articles in FSHD, research studies, things like that. Um, because I'll often get someone who calls me up and says, hey, I just got this alert about FSHD and X. Can you tell me more about it? And I'm like, I would love to, but I don't know about it yet. Um, but it's a great way to still be up to date and informed and not having to go in and do a search all the time, especially if you can use make technology work for you. Um, so those are just some, some quick ways of how you can even figure out how do we even get established and figure out how to start with getting involved with clinical trials. So before you even consider it, well, there are some questions to consider. And obviously it's not all inclusive, but a lot of questions that um, I've gotten from different patients. So um, first to consider is what is the required involvement? How many visits? How long is each visit? Is it multiple days? Is travel required? Um, th and then can you and make the next time? This has actually been kind of a barrier for some patients as I've been talking to them about some upcoming trials where there are 20 visits in a year and they're every other week and people have lives, they have work, they have school, they have, you know, a lot of things like that. And so they can't make 20 visits in a year when especially they have to be in person. Um, so that and then they have to be in person at the site. So that makes it a little challenging too, especially if you don't have a site that is across the street from you and you have to travel. Um, of course, the sponsors typically uh, provide travel reimbursement, so that does help. You need to fly, stay at hotel, meals, um, so it definitely does help um, with that, but sometimes for some people, based on their schedules, they're just not able to make that happen. So quickly understanding um, you know, from the site or from the information that you're learning about the study is what be involved. Um, and then the other um, thing that was mentioned as well is, um, is pregnancy. Usually people, usually um, the standard right now is that you should not be pregnant or plan to get pregnant during a clinical trial because we don't know the effects on the fetus. So this is something to also consider too, um, that I tend to ask of my younger patients, um, are you willing to delay any family planning um, and for the next couple of years? Because these studies will run, the, you know, the preliminary ones will run for about a year as people have mentioned, but then there's the open label extension, which can be for another year. And then there can be even longer term, um, you know, where it would just go on for several years. And of course, people can drop out of studies at any time, especially if they suddenly learn they are pregnant, or a partner is pregnant, um, that would probably just withdraw them from a study. But, um, you know, obviously we want people to be committed from the beginning and stay in the study um, so that the data is as good as it can be. Some other questions to think about too. Um, are you okay with completing the necessary procedures? I always start off with the worst of the worst whenever I'm talking um, with a with a subject who is interested in participating because um, you know if they're like nope I can't do MRIs um, you know I have you know either something that precludes me from doing it medically or I'm claustrophobic um, you know that that kind of helps rule people out and then biopsies usually um, included in some of these studies and. Um, although I think Dr. Schwab does a very excellent job with the biopsies, um, I know it's not for everybody. Um, and so, so that's something to always consider about too, is that, you know, we, we understand you're willing to participate and we definitely appreciate it, but we also want you to be entirely comfortable with what you're doing and that, you know, you're, you understand exactly what you're expected to do at every visit and, um, and that kind of thing. So like we'll always have blood draws every visit. So if you're, a difficult um, person to get blood from, you know, then it might necessarily be for you. Um, and then there's um, a lot, oh, you know, this is research. We're trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. So are you willing to accept that there might be side effects? Um, we don't know. I mean, this, the sponsors try to do their best to collect all the safety data, um, but we don't know what's going to do in you specifically. Um, so it, you know, that's something to consider as well. And then are you willing to take a placebo? Uh, a lot of people are like, yeah, I'll be in the study as long as I get the drug. I'm like, well, unfortunately we cannot guarantee that. Uh, as you have learned uh, throughout this day, um, usually it's the phase two trials with the placebo versus study drug um, phase that happens first, where usually it's a 50-50 chance that you're put in the study drug group or the placebo group. Um, I'm speaking from the ground, not specifically for any 
particular, um, you know, it's not for all of the trials, but um, this is something that should be considered too. Are you willing to go for a year knowing that you might not possibly be on the truck? Again, we won't know either way, um, but then there's always open label extension periods as well, which I'll get into. So the next question everyone always asks is, am I eligible? Um, this again, um, GM should kind of started covering a little bit of, um, and there's a lot more details obviously to this, but typical overall general criteria um, that, you know, obviously there's more specific criteria per study based on what they're looking for. Um, but just to give you an idea of kind of the general idea is they are only doing trials in adults right now, so 18 or older, but up to 65. That is the general cutoff for right now. There are some studies that might be looking at extending um, that upper age limit. Um, but for right now, most of them are cutting off at 65. Um, again, let's just talk about but genetic confirmation, poor diagnosis, and positive family history um, of FSHD is helpful. Most trials now are incorporating their own genetic testing anyway. So that's a great way um, to, you know, so you don't have to worry about having that, but it is kind of a plus to already know that you have genetic confirmation or you have at least have seen a neurologist and they've confirmed that you have FSHD. Otherwise, if you're not quite sure um, if you have FSHD, it tends to um, uh, make you less likely to be selected as a possible candidate. Um, so, you know, again, I know all of you know you have FSHD, but having those records um, are extremely helpful. And then um, able to walk about 30 feet, um, no wheelchair use, basically, as we're talking about, these, um, there's a lot of these different trials um, or procedures that need to be done where they're trying to see progression or improvements over the new trials. Um, you need to be able to at least walk 30 feet so that they can measure the changes over the time of the study. Um, usually no cancer diagnosis or undergoing cancer treatment. Um, and then no major medical conditions, which can be a wide variety of things that I'm not going to get into right now. But that, again, is something that you would talk to your clinician or neurologist about um, when defining if you know, you could be enrolled in a trial. Um, and then uh, I put a little caveat to it. Sometimes controlled conditions can be allowed. So for example, people are like, well, what about hypothyroidism? And usually it's like, yes, that's fine as long as it's managed um, with a medication. Um, and, and usually they allow those things. So that leads to me then medications. That tends to be an interesting topic. Certain, you know, obviously they want to make sure that the study drug that you're using is not going to be affected by the other drugs that you're taking. So they'll have a list typically of drugs that you're taking that might exclude you. And some of those drugs might be common ones for, um, for uh, high blood pressure, for diabetes. Um, again, this is not like a over, like this is not a global <laughs> thing, but um, this is where it's good to have these conversations with the site um, staff um, who are running the studies to just, you know, really figure out like, does this make sense? Or, you know, maybe can my doctor shift me to another medication that would still be acceptable, but still control, you know, your other underlying um, issues. Um, MRI is usually involved in these, so you have to be MRI safe, um, meaning that you can pass the screening that we have for MRI safety, um, usually no pacemaker, no brain aneurysm clips, um, you know, no, no wires, screws, rods, um, prosthetics that have ferrous metal in them. So usually people are required to have, like, have something extensive um, people are required to provide medical records um, with proof of what the metal is. So that way the MRI people feel safe that you're safe enough to go in the scanner. Um, it's not going to cause you issues. Um, and then I already talked about muscle biopsy, um, being able to have a um, muscle that is um, biopsiable. And then um, I said this before, but um, you need to draw blood. Um, sometimes it's kind of overlooked and people are like, oh, I'm a terrible draw. And I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> well, we're going to have to do this every single time. So, um, you know, usually we have some pretty good nursing staff on hand who can draw blood really well, but, um, you know, we can't get the uh, infusion team every single time in um, sometimes. So that's just something to consider too. That will be um, most likely a, a common thing of having a blood draw every visit. So we're talking about all these trials, they're coming out and you're like, so, okay, what do I do in the meantime, right? 
Um, so again, as I spoke about before, um, getting genetic confirmation or diagnosis is, is very helpful because again, it will help prove that you at least have the number one criteria, which is having FSHD. Um, and then, um, you know, if you can't get that, sometimes getting genetic confirmation results of immediate family members, like um, your parent, you know, parent or sibling, um, or a child is um, is helpful, um, and can also proving that. And then, see a neurologist. <laughs> it's kind of talking about this on the patient panel, so you know my feelings about it. But especially if it's been at least one year since your last visit, um, it never hurts to see a neurologist to kind of get a baseline to understand where you are physically. Are you able to walk that thirty feet? Do you have muscles that could possibly be biopsied? You know, all of those things that they can kind of help save you time too and understanding if you're eligible. And then they can tell you about the trials that you might be eligible for. And then what Dr. Will typically does is says, hey, I saw this patient in clinic, they're gonna be a great candidate for the study. And then they give me your contact information. And then now you're on my list. So um, that's always um, a plus. Um, and then of course they can always um, facilitate genetic testing um, as well. And then, um, as Janshin also <laughs> said, but I'm going to read because it never hurts, um, participate in non-clinical trial studies. This is what you can do while you wait. This is so helpful, not just informing, like we're not just getting the information from these non-clinical trials to inform these new clinical trials, but it gets us to know you better. It gets us to know if you are eligible for the study. So we are literally seeing patients right now for other non-clinical trials and then I'm like, great, we're going to sit down and look at your file now and compare it to the, you know, upcoming criteria for this new study and, and tell you whether or not you're eligible. Um, and, and because we've seen them recently, and because we do a lot of similar tests, we're, you know, able to do that a little bit constantly. We can't say like for certain, like, yes, you're in the study, but we can have a good idea of what's going to rule you in or rule you out. And then again, save you some time and strength as well, you know, worrying about if you're going to get into it, but then we can give you more information. So, um, Dr. Hamill kind of touched on this a little bit too. Of, um, I get this question a lot. Can I get the drug without enrolling in the study? Um, <laughs> can I go to Europe and spend $10,000 and just pay them for the drug? No. <laughs> Sorry, but no. <laughs> um, and again, as Dr. Hamill mentioned, it's, it's if the you know, pharmaceutical company you know, wants to provide that drug, they own it. We can't get it. We don't have a secret stash in our cabinet somewhere. Um, a lot of people mention compassionate use. Um, that's unfortunately does not apply for FSHD. Um, but the caveat, and this is not to entice anybody, but there is the open label extension period, which you heard about earlier, but I'll reiterate. So after you have been in a placebo controlled study, where it's placebo versus study drugs, there's that chance that you might have been not on any drug for a year. They typically now have an option to roll over into what they call an open label extension, where they're on drug. You know you're on drug, we know you're on drug, and then you're in. But you can't suddenly jump into that part if you didn't already, you know, um, do the first part of this. So that was a question I get a lot too. Of, well, can I just enter into the open label extension period when it's ready? No, you can't. You have to, you have to do the work and, and be in that first part of the study, um, unfortunately. And fortunately. Um, so it's really nice to know that you know after you possibly been taking placebo all along, someone else isn't going to just get cut in line ahead of you. Um, so so there is there is that option as well. Um, but that's like only option for right now of getting the drug. So you really cannot get it without enrolling to answer that question. Okay, this is a big one too. This kind of caused some confusion recently, and so I hope I'm going to clarify some of this um, because. A lot of people are misunderstanding when they cost. So sometimes sponsors hire third-party vendors to help screen people and decide, help them determine if they're eligible for a study. And sometimes, you know, it, it's not until you actually talk to a research site that is actually conducting a study that they're you're going to determine if you're eligible or not and if you're going to be screened or not. So, so this is how you know, a lot of people are like, well, I already talked to these people. They already screened me. I'm in the study. And we're like, but no, you're not. So you haven't even talked to the national site that's conducting it. So, um, so basically, once you have contact with the site, that's your first step. So what does that mean? You talk to one of the doctors who's running the study, or you talk to a study coordinator who's organizing the study. Um, 
And then they have, then the next step would be that they talk to you and say, yeah, you sound like you might be a good candidate. Doesn't mean you're in the study yet. We're going to schedule a screening visit. And the screening visit is where they then determine, you go through all the testing, and then they determine, are you actually eligible for the stuff? Do you meet all the parameters that they're looking for? Um, do, you know, intent and everything like that. And so then once you've completed the screening assessments, there's two options. You either fail or pass. Um, screen fail means that they found that you were not eligible, you don't meet the criteria for the study. Um, and unfortunately, that's where your journey with that particular study ends. Um, it doesn't mean it ends for any other study. But then if the good news is you pass the screening, then now you are actually found to be eligible and then you will do, um, you'll be scheduled for a baseline visit, which is when you actually start the treatment trial and then you are officially enrolled. Any questions about that? I want to pause there for a minute in case. Even if you talk to someone and they've reviewed your genetic information and they said, you sound like you're a good candidate for the study, doesn't mean you're in it yet. Not until you physically come on site to a research center and did the actual testing. Um, and if you haven't heard anything, awesome, <laughs> which I'll get to in just a second. So these are my tips. Um, so sites may be more selective when recruiting. A lot of us have these long list patients that we've talked to over the years. We've established relationships with them in clinic and research. So we have a lot of information on them. So, you know, so some sites tend to be more selective and saying, okay, we know these people are eligible or most likely going to be eligible. And then we would like to bring them in and um, see if we can enroll them in study. So it's not a first come first serve kind of basis either. So if you're like, oh my gosh, I just heard about this and the study's been enrolling for months, you might not have missed the boat. So that's always a good thing. And then also there's, there's always people who are screen failing anyway along the way. So there's always opportunity um, to make a name on the way. Establish a connection with a site coordinator. I think I said this hopefully 20 times by now. Um, really try to just talk to something like me. You call me. <laughs> a lot of people in this room call me on a regular basis. And I say, keep doing it. Um, you know, ask them what's their next step. You know, what, what's the anticipated timeline when they're actually going to get started? Um, you know, and then and then just remind them that you're interested. Sometimes, you know, I have people on my list, but then if I haven't heard from someone in a while, I'm like, well, maybe they're busy or whatever. And then I don't make too many assumptions, but I, the squeaky wheel does get the oil sometimes. And so I usually just tell patients, call me every month. You know, if you haven't heard from me, it's not that I'm ignoring you. It's, you know, it's just that we're busy. We're trying to get things up and running. And, you know, just call me, email me, whatever. It's not going to bother me for me to say, sorry, I don't have any updates. Or, hey, nice to hear from you. Actually, we're going to enroll next week. You know, like, when are you available? Um, I mean, most likely I'll be calling you. So when we're ready to recruit. But it never hurts to call um, an email. Unless, unless I tell you to stop. Um, but for me, I'm like, please do, please contact me. Um, and, and, and it never hurts to say, hey, you know, I, I get sometimes if any update and I'm like, not today. You know, and I'm like, I'll let you know when I do. But it, it doesn't bother me. I, I love to hear from everybody. I want everyone to feel like they're involved and I don't want anyone to ever feel like they've been forgotten either. Um, we're definitely still on our list. We definitely are still keeping you in mind. It's just, we get busy. <laughs> We're trying to get these studies going or running other studies. And so it never hurts to just call us. And then actually, I just got a permission from Avidity um, to give you this email address that you can write down. So if you're interested in the Avidity study, you can contact patients at aviditybio.com and they will put you on their list of potential um, study participants. So if you want to um, be considered for that study, they will, um, they ask that you do that. Because I was starting to send people directly to specific site coordinators, but they were like, can we just um, put them there? So you can let them know I'm interested, I'm located here, and they'll try to put you in contact with a local um, site coordinator. Um, so that way you can get the ball rolling with that. So that's what I'm going to end. Any questions or comments? I'll add another tip. Yeah. Okay, it's redundant, but if you're a member of the National Registry, you do recruit through the registry through. There's letters going out with announcements about studies and trials and 
Yeah, sorry, I thought I had that on my slides. <laughs> yeah, no, it's perfect. Yes. Can the subject be on two trials at the same time or not? No. <laughs> um, yeah, no, they don't want you to have to be in more than one trial. And then there actually is usually criteria that says that you shouldn't be on a clinical drug. Um, sometimes it's 60 days, sometimes it's 90 days. Sometimes It just depends sometimes on the half-life of the drug um, or what that specific sponsor wants, but they don't want you overlapping. So if, you just, if you're in one clinical trial and you decided to jump ship into the next clinical trial, then um, there'd be a waiting period where um, you wouldn't be able to start that next trial or start the drug until um, 60 to 90 days, whatever it is they're specifying um, lapses. And then you've been off that first study drug for that period because they want to have it washed out of your system and, and all of that. So. It's just one caveat. So if you screen fail for that next trial, you can't go back to the old one. Can or cannot? Cannot. cannot. Yeah. So if you try to, yeah, if you jump out of one study to try for another one, then yeah, you're not going to be able to go back in, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yes. You talk about half lives of drugs. I think about half lives as radioactive material <laughs> having half lives, but I'm, I'm, is that shelf life? What is half life? It's just how long it's in your system, right? I mean, doctors can correct me, but yeah, I mean, because you can look up like the half life of aspirin or Advil, no. and that's why they'll be like, yeah, that's why you should take it every day or something, you know, like okay. it's just based on how that's why they'll say like how often uh, you should take it. Sometimes they don't last just a couple hours. Um, that's why, like, uh, for example, in Laws Math Mod, the Fulcrum study, they take it twice a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, because it, it's, it's half life is about 12 hours. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I might just add a couple yeah. points. Um, okay, so I wanted to reiterate the screening stuff that Leanne was talking about. We did a really great job. Um, a lot of patients ask me, like, as soon as they finish the visit, they're like, Am I in the study yet? And I'm like, You've got to get back like blood results and things like that. So we normally will know whether or not you've made the screening criteria within a few weeks. We don't have to get blood results back. Sometimes your MRI, x-rays, things like that. So we won't immediately know as soon as you finish the visit that day, whether or not you've made it into the trial or not. So I just kind of wanted to reiterate that. Also, not super common for FSHD studies, but for some studies, um, even with your screening and then that first visit, um, sometimes there's some criteria with that, like they want your scores to be within 20% of each other or things like that. So even just because you're making it to that day one baseline visit, really until you finish the entire visit and we have given you medication, that's when you are truly, really in the study. Um, it's very study dependent, but I just kind of wanted to reiterate that process of like screening and getting into a trial really is until I hand you study medication or I give you something like that. So there's, yeah. yeah. But yeah, if you, if you think you've talked to a, a site and you haven't heard from them in about like a month or two after they literally were like, yeah, you're eligible and you know, we're, we want to bring you in, then I would definitely bug them and, and say, okay, like what's up? It, Cause it might not be the actual site. It might've been, like I said, a third party vendor or something else who is helping with the study, um, but sometimes there's been some confusion because people have thought that, oh, I spoke to someone who asked me all the questions and said I was good to go. Um, but it was really just another person, again, who's helping. <laughs> but there's just, you know, uh, sometimes there's just like a little bit of miscommunication. <laughs> So we have uh, a break on scheduled right now. Is everyone doing okay or should we keep going? Do we need a break? No. Okay. That means, Michaela, you're up. So Ms. Michaela Walker, University of Kansas, she is going to speak about uh, the Move and Move Plus studies, which remember, bottom line, studies, other studies, other studies, other studies. Michaela runs the Move and the Move Plus studies across the country, across North America. Yes. And soon to be the UK. Um, okay, so yeah, my name is my name is Michaela Walker. Um, I am a research project manager at the University of Kansas Medical Center. So I live in Kansas City. I do not live in Rochester, um, but I do work really, really closely with the Rochester team here. 
Um, and so I am a research project manager for the FSHD Clinical Trial Research mm -hmm. Network, as well as at the University of Kansas. And if you want to see our website, that is our QR code. It's very exciting. <laughs> Okay, so I really don't need to explain the background knowledge of FSHD, but these are pictures of some of our patients. Um, I don't think it's any of you guys in the room, but I like to include it. Um, so I will just go over it just a little bit. So FSHD is caused by the expression of a normally silenced gene, DUX4. So DUX4 is a toxic gain of function. It is a gene that has been turned on. Um, this is a dominantly inherited disease. It's considered slowly progressive. Um, and it, really the big thing is that it's very variable between individuals, even with the same mutation um, within generations of a family and even the individual themselves. A lot of times there's variability from one side of the body to another. Um, the overall reason, so the MOVE FSHD study allows us to continue following participants from a previous study we had called the Resolve FSHD study. You heard a little bit about it. Um, and it was really meant to include all individuals who have FSHD, including, you know, FSHD type 2, children, you know, those who are in a wheelchair, um, all of the individuals who might not have been able to participate in trials before. <laughs> So the primary goal of the motor outcomes to validate evaluations in FSHD or MOVE FSHD is to hasten therapeutic development and improve care delivery for FSHD. And really that's the overall goal of our research network as well is to hasten therapies getting to patients and to improve the care that we are providing to patients. Um, for this study, we are going to determine that by looking at the predictive value of motor assessments and biomarkers on milestones of disease progression. So we want to know what is predictive for someone maybe needing a wheelchair um, or an orthotic, um, maybe even a BiPAP. So really this study is trying to correlate what we're seeing at your first visit to what I like to call hard health outcomes. Okay, so the MOVE FSHD study is what we call a prospective observational study. So we are looking at you over time um, and moving forward in time, not looking back in time. There's going to be 450 FSHD participants. We have 12 sites in the United States. They are already up and running and enrolling. We have three sites that are planned for Canada and one in the United Kingdom. We plan to follow you guys for a minimum of three years with you coming to see us at least once a year. And again, our overall hypothesis of the study is that these simple motor measurements are going to predict motor milestones over time. Okay, so our study has four overall aims. Um, the first aim is to determine the rate of progression of FSHD. Um, the second was to determine the predictors of motor milestones, um, and we're going to evaluate the predictive potential of key clinical characteristics. So, you know, is genetic mutation predictive? Is your gender, your age, you know, education, um, or even how you perform on some of these baseline tasks? Um, is that going to be predictive for what might happen in the future? We're also going to look at patient reported disease impact over time. So we want to know how do you feel your disease is and how is it progressing? Um, and does it correlate to maybe what the physical therapists are seeing in the clinic? Um, and then the last aim of our study was we wanted to look at the feasibility of remote assessments. And that was something that we actually did with Dr. Hamill. Um, so there's 20 patients um, at Rochester and KU who did a remote assessment study. So basically, can we do some of these clinical trial procedures in the home and get good results? So um, we've talked a lot about inclusion and exclusion criteria today. Um, so these are the criteria that you need to get into a study. Um, the MOVE FSHD study, it's pretty minimal. As you can see, there's only four things on the slide. Um, really, to be included, you have to have FSHD. You either have a genetically confirmed FSHD, you know, type 1, type 2, you've had a test that shows that or you've been clinically diagnosed with characteristic findings and you have an affected you know, parent or child. So really we just have to know that you have FSHD and not some other type of muscular dystrophy or neuromuscular disease. Um, if you did participate in our remote assessment pilot, you needed to have Wi-Fi so that we could Zoom you. 
Um, if you didn't, then that didn't apply to you. And then the only two things really that exclude you from the study were you're not willing to provide consent to do the study. Um, and if there was another medical condition in the opinion of the doctor that would, you know, make you not a good fit for the trial. Um, we have a, a lady who has FSHD and another neuromuscular condition. So we did not include her in the study because it, it was really hard to tell is her weakness from the muscular dystrophy or is it from this other neuromuscular disease that she also has. So that might be an example of someone who wouldn't necessarily be a good fit. Um, so this is a very busy slide, but these are the overall assessments. So these are the things that we're going to be doing at your visits and the stuff that we will be collecting. Um, again, our visits are once a year. Um, we're going to have you consent to participate. We're going to determine if you're eligible. We're going to collect your demographic information, your medical history, the medications that you're taking. We are going to be doing um, questionnaires. There's six questionnaires. Um, you're going to do a physical exam with the study doctor. You're going to do different strength functions and breathing tests with Kate um, or another research PT. Um, and then we also have optional blood and saliva sample collection. And just a quick touch base on this. So we did a small remote assessment pilot. It was only 20 people, 10 from KU and 10 from U of R. Um, they came and they did an on-site visit with us. And then about two to four weeks later, we sent them a kit to their home with all these lovely things that you can see in here. Um, and then we tried to re- do that visit virtually. So you did a physical exam with Dr. Hamill. Um, you did some strength and functional tests in your home on Zoom um, and you did your questionnaires. So it was really meant to capture everything that we did in that in-person visit. And then we were trying to recapitulate it um, remotely and seeing, is it feasible? And do we get good data? And then we did it again. So we, you saw us on site a month later, we did a remote visit. And then a month after that, we did one more remote visit just to see if there were changes. Like if you learned anything and you did a lot better at the second visit. He did the functional visit. Oh, so this is why this is applicable to you. I, I, this is why I told my patients about it because half of them did it. Um, the other thing that you were using is the Actograph device. That's the lovely little red watch looking thing. That was a wearable device that you wore. Um, we're looking at basically your gait. So how you walk, how often you walk, things like that. So we do have a sub-study, it's called MOVE Plus. So we have 450 patients enrolled in the whole MOVE study, and we're hoping that 200 patients decide to do this sub-study. So really, this is just us collecting additional stuff. We're going to do a whole body MRI. We're going to do the reachable and functional workspace. And then we will be collecting your saliva, your blood, and then we're going to do a muscle biopsy. Um, so... This is MOVE Plus. Again, you're still in the MOVE study, but these are just some additional biomarkers that we would be collecting if you decide to do them. There are four more aims that are specific to the MOVE Plus substudy. The first is to determine uh, multi-site validity of whole body MRI. Basically, can a very large group of us do the MRI and get um, results that we can analyze together? Um, the second one, to determine the most sensitive MRI and clinical INE criteria to select for DUX4. So um, basically, are we looking at the right things and are we making sure that we have good um, criteria for these pharmaceutical trials that are coming down the pipeline? Um, we want to make sure that we're not excluding patients that we shouldn't be excluding and that we're not including patients that you know may not be showing um, changes in the disease. So really just trying to validate that what we're looking at um, is really going to show progression. So the third one is to determine the optimal set of DUX-related biomarker muscle targets. So again, trying to find um, DUX4 in, in the muscle and seeing if um, what really also what we're looking at is we're trying to correlate what we're seeing in the MRI to actually in your muscle. So that's something we're looking at as well. Um, and then the last aim is to evaluate the relationship between MRI signal or plasma biomarker levels and progression. There is a little bit of different criteria for Move Plus. Um, so right now we're only doing Move Plus in adults. We realize this may have been an oversight and maybe we should be doing it in kids. So that is something actually that we're looking at. But right now we're only doing the MRI and the muscle biopsies in adults. They do have to be able to walk 30 feet and they have to have a lower extremity muscle um, available for biopsy. 
the walking criteria is really in there because if you are walking, you theoretically have a leg muscle that will be safe to biopsy. If you're not walking, um, you might not have enough muscle there for us to biopsy safely. So that was really the thought kind of behind that. Um, and then the exclusion criteria, if you are taking an investigational drug or therapy, so if you're in the fulcrum study, we will not be doing the move plus sub study on you. We really don't want to do MRIs or muscle biopsies in people who are taking investigational drugs. Um, and then the other exclusion criteria, really, it's just, it's not safe for you to do the MRI and it's not safe for you to do the biopsy. Those might be other reasons why you'd be excluded for the sub-study. So um, the visit schedule, it's very similar. So you're still doing the MOVE study, um, but we are going to be collecting a few additional things, including the whole body MRI. Um, the reachable and functional workspace. Um, and then we're also going to do a biopsy at the first visit. And then for 40 patients, we're going to have them come back at a four month visit to do one more additional biopsy. Really, we're just trying to see, is there a change um, between that first visit and that month four visit? But we didn't feel like we needed to do it in everyone. There will also be some additional safety labs. We always do a couple of safety labs before the biopsy as well. Um, if you are a woman of childbearing potential, we will also do a pregnancy test just to make sure, you know, that we don't put you through the MRI or the biopsy if you are indeed pregnant. Michaela, I have a question. Yes. You're taking a biopsy in month four, and you know, to the extent there may or may not be a change, wouldn't you want to correlate that with a clinical severity score? That's actually, I mean, that's a good point. We aren't redoing the clinical severity scores, but I mean, I guess that is something that we could look at and see, did they really change over four months? We were really just looking at the muscle itself. Right, because if there's been, so if you see a change in ducts four signature off the biopsy or a change in fat fraction, that might be a questionnaire you'd want to add second X. Yeah, I was like, that's a good point. Cause I was like, we aren't doing it again. So I'll bring that up to Jeff and Ruby. Well, Rafi's here. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, what are your thoughts? Do you think we should do the clinical severity score again? Okay. All right. And now I really wanted to get into the results that we've had so far. So we've had um, more than 240 people enroll in the MOVE FSHD study. Um, all of our U.S. sites are active and enrolling. Um, and then more than half of you have actually come back for annual follow-up visits. And some of you are even starting to come back for your two-year visits, which is really exciting. Um, we have about 50 pediatric patients who are enrolled in the study. Um, and then if you were in the Resolve study previously, about 50 of you have already um, rolled over into the MOVE study. Um, and that's important because then we're going to have about five to six years of data on the people who are in Resolve and then came into MOVE. Um, also, we are continuing to enroll new patients into the MOVE and the MOVE Plus study. Um, and the MOVE Plus sub-study is up and running at 11 of our 12 U.S. sites. And then we're working on getting Canada and the U.K. up and running as well. Um, how am I doing on time, Beth? You're, oh, you're good. Okay, you great. Our break. You're great. Okay, so really kind of diving in. This is like very preliminary data that I pulled and I did myself. I really kind of wanted to take a look at our population and um, learn a little bit more about them and kind of describe what I'm seeing. Um, so this right now is just recruitment by site. So you can see how many patients have been enrolled at every site. And then um, the next set of bars with lots of different colors that tells you what kind of visits have been completed, you know, whether it's their visit one, their baseline visits, um, if they've come back up for annual follow up visits, that's the orange part, um, our remote assessment pilot, that's green, that's just KU and U of R. And then the dark blue is um, for move plus. So right now we are predominantly male. So it's actually 58% male right now and 42% female. Um, we are predominantly non-Hispanic white. Um, and that's actually something that we are trying to maybe potentially change. Like, is there a reason why we always have predominantly non-Hispanic white people in our studies? Or is that something that has to do with the disease? Um, so that is something that we're looking at as well. Our overall age breakdown. So um, we do kind of capture all ages. Our youngest participant is five um, and our oldest participants are in their 80s. So we are really capturing a broad spectrum as far as age range. You can see that most of our patients are middle-aged or even in their 60s and older. Um, so we are drawing from a, a little bit of an older population than what we might've anticipated. And so um, 
I kind of break down into that as well in a little bit. So FSHD type, um, again, it's probably what we expected to see. 88% of you guys have FSHD type one, 4% have type two, and then there's about 10% that, you know, they just have a clinical diagnosis. They don't have a genetic diagnosis, but 89% um, of our cohort has um, gen genetically confirmed FSHD. So 90% of you do have a genetic test. And then I wanted to know how many people have another family member with FSHD. Um, two thirds of you, 67% have another family member who has FSHD. Um, occupation and employment status. Um, so I come from a public health background. So I was really interested kind of to learn a little bit more about our population. And um, I think that there, um, sometimes we don't always anticipate the right questions or the right answers. So 50% of our cohort is fully full-time employed. Um, which is maybe a little bit more than what I was anticipating. So yes, I'm like 50% of you, half of you are have full-time employment um, and only about 6% are part-time employed. Um, there are quite a few people who are retired. That's why I think having people who are 65 and older and why we are, we're pulling such a large population, that makes sense to me if a quarter of our cohort is retired. Um, so those were the things that I found interesting. A quarter of you are retired, half of you are fully employed. Um, and then the, the last 25% is either, you know, students, homemakers, um, unemployed or on disability. And I also thought it was interesting that no one said that they switched professions due to FSHD. They're zero. I thought that was interesting. Has FSHD affected your employment? I also thought this was interesting. I thought everyone was gonna say yes. <laughs> Two thirds of you said no. 67% of you said no, it doesn't affect my employment, um, which I thought was really interesting. But about 15% of you did say that, you know, your job modified to accommodate having FSHD, 10% um, retired early. Um, only two people actually said that they lost their job due to FSHD, um, and about 8% went on disability. So I did think that that was very interesting as well. This is also my next favorite finding. 70% of our cohort has a college degree, a graduate degree, MD or MD or PhD. So we have a highly educated cohort. 40% just have a college degree and it actually asks highest level of education completed. So they have a college degree um, and then seven to 8% of you have an MD PhD. And then for grad school, um, it's 22%. So I thought that was really interesting because 70% of you have higher education that are in our study. Yes. So generally speaking, people with higher education get are diagnosed more. with more diseases because they do more advocacy and have access to better health care. Yes. And it's interesting also because the statistic holds true in a one payer system like Canada. So you would think that in Canada, you would have an evening out, but it goes back to this whole idea of diagnosis. Those people who can articulate their symptoms and do a better job advocating to see more doctors are more likely to get a diagnosis. Yeah, that makes sense. And maybe if they're more highly educated, they're more likely to seek out trials um, and other things for themselves as well. Exactly. So I'm like, it makes sense, but I still found it really interesting that you guys were so educated. <laughs> okay, first symptom. Um, this room in particular is very good looking. Well, there we go. I'm like, maybe that should be our next survey. <laughs> um, probably not surprising, proximal arm weakness. So arm weakness up here towards your shoulders. That was most people's first symptom, um, followed by facial weakness and then other. So my next project's probably gonna be diving into this other symptoms, what those are. Um, but yes, overall, probably what you'd expect to see is having arm weakness and facial weakness. That was the most common. Some people also did report distal leg weakness. So maybe having that foot drop. So I'm, like tripping was my husband's first symptom. Yep. So that would fall into where? Distal like weakness. Ah, uh, okay. So maybe I had to warn this because I'm not super clinical. <laughs> so proximal means basically close to the joint, and distal distal means distance, far. So distal can would be your weakness, proximal would be your shoulder weakness, and then for legs, distal would be like your feet and your ankle, and proximal would be like your hips. Gotcha. I have trouble with down. Interesting. And some people also reported trunk weakness as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so clinical severity scores. So this is basically the doctors um, look at 
look at your FSHD and they give you essentially a number and it's supposed to correlate to some of like your weakness um, things like that. Again, we have a pretty broad array of um, patients. I mean, we have patients with no weakness at all to patients who are completely wheelchair dependent. Most patients fall in the middle, as you can see. So six, six is mild weakness of the pelvis and proximal leg muscles. So again, you're weak in your hips um, and they, but they can still stand up from a chair without support. So that is where most of our patients are falling. So that's a quarter of them. Okay. Breathing. So I wanted to dive into some of the other areas that we're looking at um, that are important to patients. So 30% of our patients said, yes, I have difficulty breathing. And then did they feel, did their doctor feel it was related to FSHD? Um, so about half, it said no, it was 50-50, either related or not related. And then only 15% of people actually use a breathing machine. So a BiPAP or a CPU. <laughs> Do you have eye problems? Um, so again, 30% said yes. Um, most of them, almost 60%, it was felt like it was not related to their FSHD. And I will also reiterate, this is other than needing contacts or glasses. It does say that in the question. So it's other than needing contacts or glasses, do you have eye problems? Um, and we only had three people who had a retinal hemorrhage, three people who had a retinal detachment, and then one person so that they have Coates disease. Um, and then there's a lot of others. So again, I'm going to have to go see what all of these other potential eye problems are. Michaela, okay, are the change in vasculature in the eyes, it's mostly subclinical, right? We almost all have it. Ravi, is that right? I was like, yeah, this, sure. I'm gonna... Uh, I mean, it... it says my time's up. Oh. <laughs> yes, it's, it's usually asymptomatic, but I mean, the vast majority of patients don't have it, unless you look at the very different <laughs> green curve. Uh, you can see a little bit. Um, Again, most of it is, is asymptomatic. Question? Most patients have a subclinical change in retinol. What's subclinical? It, 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 not clinical. It doesn't present with any symptoms. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that's a fair point. I, I mentioned that because when I worked in rare disease at Genzyme, we often talked to ophthalmologists and optometrists to help diagnose patients. Mm -hmm. For example, Fabry, MPS patients, you see corneal whirling. So the eyes are often mm -hmm. an interesting window into disease. But I don't think anyone's ever approached ophthalmologists or optometrists for diagnosis. Not for FSHD. I was like, I've worked with it in other disease right. groups, inc yeah. including like limb girdle and Duchenne, but I've right. not ever done it with FSHD. Yeah. Um, and then the next one was hearing loss. So I, we wanted to know, was anyone diagnosed with hearing loss? About 18% said yes, um, which I, I thought that was interesting. Um, and I also wanted to know who was using assistive devices. So about 15% um, of you were using a wheelchair and about 15% were using a scooter. So that was something that I found interesting as well. And then overall conclusions. So the MOVE FSHD study, it was really meant to address barriers to clinical trials by helping validate motor, clinical, and patient reported outcomes, as well as potential biomarkers. And the project's significant in that FSHD is a common muscular dystrophy. It's the second most common muscular dystrophy. Um, and results can have a direct impact on your care, on the understanding of the disease, and on the design of clinical trials in the future. Um, and for future considerations. Um, so we are continuing. We're always looking for new sites, new collaborators. Let us know if you want to get involved. Um, we are looking to expand the pediatric cohort. So we kind of realized that while we are allowing children to enroll in the study, we weren't being super targeted about it. So we are looking to expand the pediatric cohort and do assessments that are specifically for kids. We're also looking to do the MRI, the muscle biopsy and reachable workspace in kids as well, because we think that could provide really valuable information. Um, additional biomarker collection um, in Move Plus participants. The wearable devices, that's like a really hot, sexy topic right now. Um, so we are thinking about adding those wearable devices to um, our, our study as well, probably just Move Plus. Um, and then we thought about allowing for enrollment or biomarker collection of asymptomatic patients with FSHD or even healthy controls. Um, and sometimes I'm like, I don't know always if asymptomatic is the right word. Sometimes it's pre-symptomatic, maybe depending on who you have your disease. Um, so we have thought about maybe having a, a, an expansion for that as well, just to collect some additional biomarkers and take a little further look into the disease.
And then I just want to say thank you. So a big thank you to our participants. Many of you in this room are doing this study and have done a lot of our studies. We could not do this without you. Um, and then I want to say a big thank you to the study investigators, the clinical evaluators, the study coordinators um, who do the studies and perform the visits. And thank you all for having me here today. Um, I'm going to, can you go back two slides because you glossed over the slide, the one right before this, and this is like huge. It's like for me, this is like why the heck are you doing move? Like, why should I go in and spend an entire day, come home completely exhausted? But this is it's really important what you guys are, the data you're collecting, and why you're doing it. So say this one more time. And <laughs> yeah. why do I care? Okay. So the overall thought to the study, move FSHD, it addresses barriers to clinical trials and FSHD. We need to validate the motor assessments, the clinical assessments, and the questionnaires that we're doing you, with you guys, as well as potential biomarkers. So in order for pharmaceutical companies to be able to come into the space and show that their drug works, we have to be asking the right questions and measuring the right things all in the same way. So Barriers to clinical trials and FSHD, it's going to help by validating motor, clinical, and patient reported outcomes, as well as potential biomarkers for the disease. And it's significant because FSHD is the second most common muscular dystrophy, and the results of this study can impact your actual care in clinic, our understanding of the disease itself, and help design future clinical trials. It's really important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and I can really reinforce what you were saying. I mean, one problem that we are having at Fulcrum is we, we really are not sure what is the best way to look at patients. And that has a lot of implications. So it has implications to have a successful trial because our drug may work, but if you're not looking at the right thing, then it may appear to, to fail. It has implication also for the regulatory agency, FDA, they say, yes, you are, you are measuring an improvement in the reachable workspace, but does the patient feel that in their activities of daily life, they are, they are doing better? And so we have to be able to show that. And then also assuming the drug, any drug is successful and is approved by the FDA, the next step, which is very important, is will it be paid by insurance company? And insurance company, they can say, oh yes, you know, your drug is approved, but I don't think you have really shown that it helps patient and that, you know, in, in the end, it's going to save me money, which is what they are, they are looking for, many of them. Um, so all this, this preparatory work that, that you know, all, all the, the basic researchers are doing, this is absolutely key to, uh, to the future. So thank you. Thank you all for doing this because that's so sorry. And it's a cross sponsor, and I'm not talking in programs name. This applies to any any pharma that wants to develop drugs. Thank you. Yes, Jordan. Um, I have a quick question. Did you ask anything on there getting back to kind of like the public health health piece? Did you ask about household income? I did not. Actually, I didn't even think about that, which is probably actually a really big factor. Yeah. Um, we didn't ask about it. I think that gets back to, I mean, your slide about education level and inclusion of minority populations. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of this is dictated by who gets testing. Yep. Who gets in the door at a neuromuscular clinic. And then, I mean, less, I mean, I, to the advocating for yourself, absolutely. But if you don't even have the means to get and if you don't have the means to pay the $1,500 that it's going to take to get testing, um, it's a huge barrier. And so I think that assessing for that and kind of quantifying that on this level would be really helpful to, I mean, even argue to Medicare, I can't get testing for the majority of my Medicare patients now, and, and that is a huge, huge barrier. So um, we are uh, tracking salaries, uh, household salaries in our health economics study. And so we have two sources of data. One of them is claims data from insurance companies, and the other one, which included actually Medicare. Cool. And then the other one is a survey that we sent out. But um, I think our survey results were kind of similar to what you showed, uh, highly educated population with much higher um, average incomes than the standard population in the US. Mm -hmm. and, and also individuals who have uh, a better paying job usually have more. Um, you know, they, they, they can take off time, somebody who's, working a low paying job. Yeah, right. 
in travel. I mean, patients travel. that live rurally yeah. or don't live near a major metropolitan yeah. area that has a neuromuscular center, like they're going to be see, seeing a neurologist that maybe has never seen an FSH patient before. And so, mm. um, I mean, these are huge healthcare equity questions. And, and I think it's just important that we keep that in the back of our mind and part of the conversation when we're talking about who's included in these studies and um, and who's getting access to care and who's not. And to kind of pivot and caveat off of the who's included in studies, the other reason why MOVE is so important is because it's in, it's thought to include everyone who has FSHD. Right now with a lot of clinical trials, it's if you're an adult who can walk. Mm -hmm. um, but in order to get drugs to everyone, you really need data on the whole population itself, not just adults who can walk. Um, so having this data and showing the greater population and what it looks like, that's going to be really important for when a drug is approved so that we can actually get it to everyone and not just um, the people who met the criteria for the trial. Because um, um, insurance companies, I was like, lost the word. Insurance companies love to play that game with us sometimes of, oh, well, why should we let this person take it? Because they wouldn't have matched the criteria of the study. So that's why, you know, kind of a broader study like this is important. Any other questions? I will echo working with insurance companies is really hard, right? <laughs> In my experience, they never want to treat someone who's too sick. Mm -hmm. They never want to treat someone who's not sick enough. Mm -hmm. So identifying the, you know, the major clinical events and the timeline for what happens to patients as they progress is particularly important because you want to catch them early and prove to the insurance companies that catching people early is important. And I just wanted to add about the MOVE study because we are still trying to recruit for it. <laughs> it, it actually isn't an all-day study visit. It's usually under two hours. We're going to get it to about an hour now. Um, and it's usually done in conjunction with your clinic visit. So if you're already seeing your neurologist, which again, we I highly recommend, um, you can combine it with that. So then right after your, your clinic visit, you can go over and complete the rest of your research visit. And then um, we're trying to do that to make it convenient, more accessible. Because again, we understand taking time off and things like that is difficult. So if you're already having to take time off for your clinic visit, we might as well combine it um, with a little bit of the research. Um, and then it's a very quick study so that we can try to get it done quickly and, and make it easy for people to participate in. I will say the first visit's normally a little bit longer because you're doing everything for the first time. You're signing the consent. So I would say that one is probably more about three hours. Leanne and the U of R team are just extremely efficient. They really know what they're doing. So, but that first visit's probably gonna be a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, and then, oh, we have a question. Yay. When are you recruiting in Canada and how do we sign up for that? Um, well, you guys can email me. And I got it. Okay. I was like, it's a very last slide. I have your, um, you can email or call me and then two of our Canadian sites. So Montreal and Ottawa, I think that they will be up and running like literally within hopefully a month or so. Um, so they should be up and running and enrolling this summer. And then our site at Calgary, um, they're a little bit further behind. Their PI was on sabbatical. So we're still getting them up and running. And then we do have a site in Sheffield, UK. They will also be probably recruiting by the end of the month or in June. So it is coming. It's very exciting. And we'll work with the FSHD Society and our other advocacy groups to send out an email blast for our non-US peeps that want to participate. And then one more thing before I leave you guys, um, I wanted to reiterate some of the things we're looking at and correlating, especially MRIs and muscle biopsies. I think patients are like, why are you doing this? You know, it's no fun. It's kind of invasive. Um, what we're really looking at in the field right now is, is what we're seeing in the MRI actually what we're seeing in your muscle tissue. And that's really important for us because then maybe we don't have to take muscle biopsies all the time. We could just you know, do an MRI and see, does that actually correlate to disease progression? Um, same thing with some of these outcome assessments is what you're seeing and what you're reporting, what Kate is seeing as a physical therapist. And so far, a lot of times, yeah, patient reported outcomes do really a lot of times correlate with the actual function that we're seeing in the clinic. So validating these things is really important so that we can use them in clinical trials going forward, but also whenever drugs get approved, you have to do a lot of these tests as well in order to get the medication. So that's why it's important. We want to make sure we're looking at the right things, measuring the right things, and that we're not doing things that are unnecessary. I will get off my soapbox now. Thank you. Okay.
Um, now we have a fun discussion period. I'm going to have Michael and Sandra, as you are able to come to the front. We're going to do a little patient, uh, we'll call it, we're calling living with FSHD, just a little patient. This is my experience with FSHD. This is this is uh, my take on it, my story, and just open it up for discussion here and for folks here to share as well as you're comfortable. Um, but I'd like to introduce Ms. Sandra Bird. She came all the way from mid Connecticut somewhere. I have no idea if you guys came early. And her husband, James, they came up um, yesterday, right? Yes. Yeah, so this is Sandra Bird. And then we have Michael Gottlieb. You guys came down to the channel area, is that right? Um, this morning, which is also quite a drive. So thank you both for joining us here today. I don't know, whatever you're comfortable sitting, standing. Sandra, do you want to sit? And I'm going to bring a microphone. yeah, I know it's just like vegan, it's not good. You, okay. Um, yes, I'm Sandra, I'm from Rose, Connecticut, and I'm a retired pediatric nurse who spent over 40 years taking care of children with special needs and moved to Children's Hospital and then doing private TV home care. Um, and I think that the reason that I was able to work as long as I did was because it was for children. You have to do a lot of heavy lifting. Which all helped. Um, I Let's see, I didn't really notice anything unusual until I was in my new courts. So by then I had already had two children. And um, I was just working and um, enjoying life in general. And then I started to notice that um, there was something wrong with the muscles in the back of the legs, my hamstrings. If I was on the stomach and I, was, I tried to do a leg curl where they could talk um, from being on my stomach and I couldn't get the hand the bar. And that really like made me say, what's going on, you know? And then um, not too long after that, I was trying to reach up to something high in my kitchen. And then I noticed my left foot didn't go up on my toes. I was busy, so I ignored it, and then I went um, to uh, plug something in up high over my head, and my arms wouldn't go up. I said, this something's really wrong. So by then, I was probably um, and so I went for an orthopedic um, issue, and I pointed out to the surgeon that I couldn't resist him trying to pull my legs. I was sitting on the edge of the exam bed trying to um, show him, you know, resistance wasn't there. I was not working. So he sent me to PT and unbeknownst to me, that therapist thought I had muscular dystrophy. Of course, he couldn't tell me. So he told my doctor, he referred me to a neurologist, and that neurologist what well, didn't specialize in anything, but he said, I think you know, and they had to sit on the floor and try to get up and down the work out too well. So he said, Well, I know who will see you. And I'll give you a call. And so I was referred to Dr. Police at the hospital for special care and pray. And they had the MBA clinic. And at my very first appointment, they, he said, I know what you have. Well, um, 
so Dr. Felice took one look at me and he had me pucker my lips and <laughs> I wasn't symmetrical with that. Um, although I could close my eyes tightly, which was so true. Um, but he told me right then that he knew that I had MSHD. And then he did an EMD and I had a blood test to the right. So at that point, he said, you need to meet my mother <laughs> because my mother was very debilitated. At age 75, she found out that she had MSHD, despite not getting to many doctors over the years. Nobody ever thought it was a general surgeon. So it turns out that that's where one of my children has it, and the other has to be tested. But the one that has it has no symptoms. Well, apparently, so far, it was older. My mother didn't go in. Um, most support that I get to deal with this whole thing is uh, number one, the MSHD Society, which is in the community. Um, I also have many, taken part in many online support groups sharing information. Um, it's just a wealth of young communications to me. Uh, and as a result, I also become um, personal friends with a few of them. I don't have to be personal with them first. Um, so I like to go to the conventions that they have every two years. Um, I just came to the first solo play to Florida. Um, <laughs> and they used to do their hair and they were happy. Faith in the Lord. I am very active in my church, and it's a very small church. And I have lots of close friends um, that really know me very well and are very supportive of me. So I'm grateful for that. Um, physically, I would say um, my shoulders are very weak. My hip girdle is very weak. My low back. I saw my MRI. It's all turned to the um, I have no foot drop, minimal facial weakness, and no respiratory involvement. And my Florida exercise is in the pool every week, at least twice a week, for about an hour. Um, sometimes I'm more vigorous with it than other times. Sometimes I just talk to a lot of people, but it's always a good thing. It's a warm therapy. And it's at the hospital for special care, which is a rehab hospital. And it has... Um, it has also has a full size Olympic pool, which is also warm, but not as warm as the therapy pool. So anyway, I love going there, and I make it, you know, almost every week, twice a week. I would say that my biggest adjustment to having this disease has been accepting or asking for help versus being the caregiver nurse. So um, I've been forced to just by the nature of it. And the positive part is that I have met some of the people that I never would have met. Um, they've enriched my life and I've learned from them and I've been able to share my experiences with them. Um, and just three side things here. Um, and maybe I've heard it from the support groups. Not all pain or symptoms are related to FSHD. So you need to still be aware that other things can go wrong with your body and not have it be related to FSH things. And I've experienced that. Um, and you need to advocate for yourself. Um, keep looking for the answers you need and discover sometimes it's by listening to other people's suggestions or just figuring it out for yourself. Um, and I did want to say, when we were talking about the blood vessels in the eye, um, about four years ago now, I had an occluded blood vessel near the retina in my left eye, which was causing a hemorrhage. And uh, I have no idea if it was related to this, but my eyes are the doctor, the retina specialist, and 
he said that he does have one other woman who lived at his age day who has a sex life. But he treated it with injection. And, um, and, he's, and, and cleared up almost immediately very well. He's very happy with the response. And uh, it's it's gone now, but he's still monitoring. So it's been four years. But um, I thought it was worth mentioning since it had been mentioned. So anybody want to ask any questions? <laughs> That's all I have to say. Yeah, sorry, one question. Do you, how I do disease progress overall? Is it the slow decline or? It's a very slow decline, yeah. From the time I discovered it, um, even in just the last year or so, I've noticed that I'm having more difficulty with my left side is being broken, my left leg isn't um, doing what it used to do. Um, I used to be able to wear some shoes that were they're pretty heavy actually, that are called Viva, and you just put your foot on the ground and you slide right in. Well, they weigh maybe another six ounces more than other shoes. And I've noticed lately that there are problems in me now. So at least with my left leg. So, um, but yeah, it's mostly that and somewhat with the reaching up, I don't seem to be able to reach as high as I, once did so. And, and have you noticed whether there is something that happened to you that, that triggered the worsening, or it's just a well, it's steady? interesting that I discovered it around the time of menopause. <laughs> yeah, I'm um, yeah, hearing that today. Um, but not this specific. Um, I have two children. Um, I think it's actually not as a part of the I guess when you know, said, when did you, you know, the things happened way in the past, you know, when did you first think maybe retrospectively? And I would say that I remember now my parents saying to me that they had to take me to a park to make me run. I didn't want to run, I wanted to walk. Okay. And then, oh, I could never run in the class. I always had bad days in the class. My teacher tried to get me to put a uh, hang on to the bar and hold myself, and I immediately dropped. And she said, I don't know if I thought was there to hang on. And oh, I know these things come back to my mind now. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> all. Right. So, yeah, it's just little secrets in my past. <laughs> oh, it's skiing. I used to ski, but I could never master the my name is Michael Godley. I think many of you in the room have heard my story, and Beth showed me a list of questions three minutes ago, and I'm probably not going to cover all of them, but please prompt me if I miss something. It's also uh, important to disclose, and Beth, you asked me to speak about this. Uh, I'm the CEO of Renogenics, and I work with Peter Jones, Stephen Tapscott, and Sarah Vandemar. We have a company called Renogenics. Uh, it is CRISPR's therapeutics company. It's a pretty incredible solution here at the same time. My wife probably will be there. Um, it's a pretty incredible solution for this technology. Thank you guys. So when I was four years old, a kindergarten teacher called my mother and said, Michael, my mother said, probably my grandmother said, you know, just like me. Uh, <laughs> in the subject of ridicule through junior school and old grades because I couldn't perform in sports. It was always tough. It was always hard to push up and sit up. And I wasn't lazy. I just couldn't do it. Gosh, I even remember my parents trying to run me the bar to get the exercise. Never, ever. Mm -hmm. So I continued along. I was doing fairly well. And I was, when we were 12 years old, I woke up and had headaches. And I was busy every morning for two years. And I was seen by a relative in Canada, the United States, and for some children. And no one could Eventually, those symptoms subsided, and then I 
I can think of these symptoms subsided, but I had this incredible interest in the science of medicine. I did not want to try and figure out what was wrong. This continues to try to be not sure if it's sports. And I started working with research lab and developed this interest in science and pursuing the biology that we have for life in the era. And I'm still in the middle of the kids that come in at 79. All have this And when I look at other things, we often see more than 50% of the viewers seem to have a character to survive. But the FSAT genes are pretty similar. They do pop up. Um, but back to my clinical discovery, I, we had our first child. And what if parents like when I was twenty seven, I don't want to speak to that. I realized that our son should be my neck. And at that time I was working with these business working on muscles. I didn't think I would at the same time. A what, Michael? Respiratory insufficiency. So it's possible to also many you have other FSHD symptoms. My wife tells me I don't hear about well. Yeah, uh, yeah, total <laughs> hearing loss for anything I say. <laughs> um, he, and has no idea where the dirty laundry hamper is, and apparently that is muscular dystrophy. So I didn't know this. Today, I think is more important than I was. So today, the exercise was five or six days a week. It's made an incredible difference in my life. That on the nutrition and diet diabetes. That's many. I went from this thinking every day. Fall asleep at 6 or 7 o'clock, being exhausted from your pain and the stress of the day. To now, I mean, you think you're going to be married to the person. So I go to the gym. We'll do all six hours of driving today. So my uh, energy level and, uh, is yeah. completely different. I'm able to make very significant I joke that I work on each of the workspace. So <laughs> I'm making great improvements in that area. Um, but I think. Patients certainly kind of take this on themselves. But the one thing that everybody from all the different companies has agreed when we've met with them in the past is that the better the shape you're in, by the time you find the clinical trial that's right for you, the more likely that that treatment's going to work, right? So it's not about, um, it, it's not binary, it's not wait for. A, a treatment or a trial, or just think that diet and vitamins are going to cure you. It's get in the best shape you can, and then you're going to have the best results you can with it with your treatment. I don't know, Beth, if you want me to talk about this first. Well, what led you to be part of this program that you talked about at the beginning? Yeah, so I've been very in my career. I've, uh, I've always had an interest in science. I worked in a public health capacity in Canada, understanding how our healthcare system worked. I moved over to pharmaceutical operations, ultimately leading to business within and counting rare disease drugs across a big portfolio. 
there's a working in the gene for a period of time, which talked about this with other neurologists. You sit in a room, you sit at a park bench, and you look at people and you like to try and figure out what's wrong with them. And it's a problem. And, and you know, while we joke, um, it's taken us so long to get a diagnosis, and it took me 30 years to figure out what's wrong with me. Now I can sit in the middle of the schoolyard and pick up kids with muscle and just like, yeah. yeah. You know, and we all can we all can do that. So I not to know the Genzyme at the time we have four we have four children. The Genzyme one obviously I had to work with my family and I was able to start an oncology opportunity to work on projects on projects so it's given me a chance to step on that song is the world. So that's why I partnered with Peter Silver. This is going to to accelerate it. I admire the company as well. Because without those leading the way, we would not be in a position to help with our budget. Whether it's fit in the full time or others, we're learning a tremendous amount of education about their clinical symptoms and the new studies and support that's being done by the network. And in all the time, it's been the ground for getting the FDA ready for our discussion so that when we do the problem and look at the problems, excuse me, I've had this much food. Just put seaweed in his water. <laughs> So it was the seaweed in the water. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think ultimately the solution for us as a patient community is more likely than not multiple therapies sound. So, Gwen, I think with you with it showed a graph. You know, how can it transcribe the RNA and then you get broken? So, you know, CRISPR therapeutics works on the gene, and the question is, can we silence the gene? In addition, in particular, the genetics is here, the gene network, the amount of the gene, sending everybody up, and it's not always all on. So, what we try to do is put the offset on top of every region that needs to be on, and that's CRISPR. Our AI therapy company is trying to take that message to these transcribes and tweak it out of the body. And then you have your other molecules um, that are attempting to target that spore and trying to bind to that protein that somehow from the body. But we do know that spore is a bunch of protein and we can move it off. There will be more of my networks, perhaps therapies to get together. That was all his problem. Yeah. <laughs> People are having difficulty hearing you. So then we were just thinking, actually, if we probably go, we picked up better over. Oh, right, we're just sitting over there. So there's mics in the ceiling. Yeah. Oh. And they're not outside. Now we have questions. Just hold it really close to your mouth when you answer yeah, questions. Hold it close to my mouth. Sorry. It's not working that well either. Oh. Go ahead. When he taps on it, I can hear it. Okay, I, I, I'll talk more quick, more loudly. Yeah. That was good. Oh, yeah, that was good. I did but see one slide. MRNA did come up. That was part of the chain. Okay. But MRNA did come up as part of the chain. But I think here, of course, COVID and all the vaccine turns out companies like Moderna and Pfizer come up with an emergency MRNA vaccination extremely quick. Compared to what the normal approval process is, how come someone like you know, that can say, "Gee, we do have sort of their virus," you know, and figure that out? But when it comes to you know, SHD, HD, keep them all in a solution. Uh, is that, is or is that effective? I don't know that Michael wants to answer that yes. with his, <laughs> um, with his CEO hat <laughs> okay. on. Um, uh, like I will just say, the lay person yeah. that and 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 maybe you want to talk about this uh, more. In fact, I I suggested that would be a good topic one day for a meeting. Is there's different sorts of speeds of trials, and the FDA can decide when things need to go through more robust testing versus exceptional circumstances. So they, they said COVID was an exceptional circumstance. So it's one of the things to be aware of with this disease 
is that they can make decisions also on how they approve um, drugs for trial based on what other treatments are out there and how vocal the patient community is. So if they have really loud and upset patients mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of other treatments, they might look at data that is less certain and decide to give it a pass to go forward. So it's not binary. There's different circumstances under which the FDA will make these decisions. And when we talk about safety, like whatever side of the um, COVID vaccine you are on, and I'm not judging here, I'm just saying, mm -hmm. by the definition that the FDA uses, it's safe. Mm -hmm. And so then one of the things that is a good idea for all of us who are looking at treatments, and I, and notwithstanding what my husband does, I have four kids and all, we will make our decisions, right, is what are your standards for safety? So look at what, you know, because safe is like, sometimes safe is you know, for cancer drugs, it's safe is it doesn't kill you and will, you know, likely be safer than the cancer growing in your body. Sometimes safe is it doesn't kill you on the spot. Sometimes safe is we know it doesn't kill you in a year and a half. It doesn't actually necessarily mean it's safe according to what we would think is safe, right? Can you think of an industry that you are in with great diseases and they look into things like stem cell research? Because you see the activist thing. It's your spinal cord injuries. So, uh, I'll answer that in part. So there is a company, Jamshid, you mentioned it. It is on in, yeah, slide. Investigating injections of stem cells. There are a couple challenges with that therapy. So, you know, I'm six feet tall and fairly heavy. Pick which muscle you're going to inject first and, and tell me you know, where I have highest pain it's impractical, in my opinion, to inject stem cells in my body. And then we have further questions about whether or not those cells actually adhere to the muscle scaffold. And then we have the compounding question, well, you just injected good cells, maybe, we don't know yet, maybe good cells into an environment which is just a swimming pool of dust. I will let you know, I'll let others draw draw their own conclusions on that. So. You know, Where I think we need to country that they were they gave the uh, like the the freedom to operate for all uh, biotech startups was that the Honduras? Sorry. Remember, we got emails from some people who are going to travel offshore for for yeah, some. There, some, there are some yeah. so, like a new region. I think it's um, in Honduras yeah, that it, all, it for stem cell injections. like. It, it, there's no regulation, there's no oversight, right? And so, yeah, you can hear that, you know, the doctors, so someone sent forward me a, a letter from a doctor who operates there saying that he's cured people with muscular dystrophy, including your form and people who have paralysis and this and that, and, you know, brought Jesus back to life. And so, and and they, they got their no malpractice and we there. And well, I would avoid some of those friends. Uh, so, you know, they're truly tested and Okay. Uh, I will also mention that Renogenics is supporting here and bringing forward the diagnostic that many of us are familiar with, the methylation score. And I've shared my methylation score with some of you at this point of reference. Mine's 8%. So well, let's be clear it's not diagnostic. That is a word that is thrown about, and it has to be very clear that it is not diagnostic. So it is not word. a CLIA certified test. Thank you very much. Um, Rafi, I know Peter received samples from you and from many others in the room. Um, so it's not a CLIA certified test yet. That's correct. Meaning it can't be used um, for, 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 it be used in for inclusionary in file yeah. until, and, and the company, our company is moving forward. Do you want to just clarify? You're in the process of seeing of seeking CLIA certification. So they they they. Right. So be careful until it's finalized, because there's been a lot of misconceptions too in the patient community thinking they're getting diagnostics. From this saliva test, when it's yes, but one of the opportunities for the patient community um, is that in this um, period before CLIA certification comes through, which we have every reason to believe it will come through, it's also an opportunity 
to have some family members who were thinking that they wanted to get tested, but maybe didn't want to have testing that was official done to have testing done. Okay. So I know that's, that's. There's a little bit of concern there too, in that there's not genetic counseling, there's not additional information yeah. that's provided along with the results. Well, that's so not. What also leads to some. That, that's not all. And some. That's not altogether true. You can disagree true. with me, but. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, it's not altogether true because number one, in some countries like ours, we don't get genetic counseling. We get the tests just sent to us, uploaded on our, our, our labs, and we see the results. So, and if we want genetic testing, we can get in a queue for three years. But it doesn't matter. The point is, is that genetic counseling, other tools like that are what help provide, like clear up misconceptions. So just because that's what's happening in one country doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing. And that's why I think when we talk about these tools and everything, they're important because, you know, it helps clarify misconceptions. Like that's kind of the point of some of this day today too, is to allow the patients to better understand what it is we're doing, what it is we're talking about, what it is, what's the information that they're getting. So that's why we have to still be very careful. I'll interrupt your point. Right, right now, the diagnostic representation is not a promise for you. And that's a huge balance. So patients need to spend an additional fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars, which is unaffordable for many. And we're looking for ways to accelerate your diagnosis because that is the key to hopefully how the patients are. So until you have a diagnosis, and I went to sixty five years and not a lot without a diagnosis, it is particularly troubling. I was in I was in it to a psychiatric ward for sure all of this in my head. So maybe that's a good thing. I would make a good few slides now. Great, but I just think until it's it's confirmed, we need to be careful. So then we all know that it's in the process of CLIA certification. So if anyone's concerned that the CLIA certification hasn't been completed, you've been warned. So, so we're trying to move it. Yes. Yeah. Besides the clear certification, which is more a validation that the method is yeah. measuring what it is, there also has to be an acceptance from the clinical community that it is diagnostic of FSA. Excellent. So though this is fantastic because I, you know, having tried to set up uh, direct to consumer genetic testing and with the costs associated with it. We were only able to raise so much funding, and uh, I think having additional tests uh, that are offered and with the genetic counseling and everything that goes along with it for better inform uh, to, to better educate the consumer on what the results mean. I think this is going to be fantastic and complete game changer. One more comment from our I'm very cautious of our time, and so we need to move on. So one more comment. Yeah. One thing, I mean, I, you know, I, I know Peter is very smart and, but, you know, he's reached out to some of our families and, and did the genetic testing and gave them predictions about the severity, which I don't think there's enough data to say this amount of methylation predicts a certain progression. Okay, but we got predictions about severity here six years ago at the patient conference that didn't turn out to be true. So I'm I'm not sure what that has to do with the price of tea in China. I don't you know I don't have the data. I didn't give for brainy slides for you that way. No, that's not that's still enough time to get the normal better. That's another interesting tool in the clinician. So with that, I'm going to take these conversations because we were a family panel here. So um, if you have any questions for Michael about um, genetics and the work that they're amazing. Or my, or my story, or just generally. Or for Sandra, story, um, or the... Uh, Clinical diagnostic test that um, Jones is doing. Please, afterwards, people are going to hang out on social time um, at 3 30. But we still have just one more presentation, which just happens to be mine. And um, we can leave everybody with a little bit of hope and love, and so we can have a little kumbaya and, and be gone. So thank you so much, Sandra and Michael, for your talk today.
Can I just say something as a patient? Because I'm sitting here and I'm I'm just gonna say this and I'm a little nervous to say it, but I'm sensing a lot of tension in this room. And I, I need to understand as a patient why. Because Beck knows I've supported the FSHD society for years and years and years. Um, I've recently become, come to know Tamara and Michael. I think they have, they can't, I, I, am, I love functional medicine and I believe in good food and supplementation. I've been like that. I brought my children up like that and I believe in it clean water, all that kind of stuff. And as a patient, it's pretty upsetting. I, I'm actually shaking a little bit here because we need you guys to come together. Like the conflict is not gonna serve us as patients. So I, I don't know if there's conflict, but I'm sitting here right now and I sense, I'm actually feeling like quite nervous saying this, but I'm asking you guys, like all of you, like you need to come together because it's it's not going to work if like what is this conflict? Can I can I address this as a scientist? Yeah, disagreements in scientific view is actually what drives science forward. So I welcome when I we present and do a uh, experiment, and we have a particular interpretation of it, and another scientific group has a different one. It actually helps. So um, I'm actually I love these kind of discourses, and it energizes me. Um, so I'm sorry that the reaction, it, it's, I don't know, from the clinicians and the practitioners. So I think you guys probably have the same kind of experience. You have you get with your colleagues and you discuss things and not everybody's on the same page. And that's how I think progress is made. So uh, sorry. we. I mean, it's not about upsetting us, but like, I, you know, there is great disagreements in the medical world between Western medicine and Eastern medicine. And you'll go to a Western doctor and they'll say, you know, all that other stuff is nonsense. And then you go to an Eastern doctor and they say, all that other stuff is nonsense. I personally believe for myself that nutrition and exercise and getting vitamin D and sun on my skin and drinking clean water, like, you know, when I go to a restaurant, I spend money on bottled water. I don't drink tap water. And so everyone's different, I understand. But like, I feel like we as patients also need the Western medicine people who we respect so highly and we go to for help because we need them and they're amazing and they study so hard and they put all their lives into this stuff to help patients like me. Um, but especially for FSHD, like it's a lifestyle and we really need to all start understanding, like I love what Michael said, like to advocate for ourselves, because like I want doctors, I really do, like this is a call to doctors to really open up to the food you're eating and the need for protein and the need for magnesium and vitamin D and all these things, because I really think it's going to help us with this disease. So I just needed to say that. And I have sure, respect yeah. for everybody that's trying to help us. Okay. Thank you. Very grateful. So I, I, I can make a comment. I was two hats on my head as a Western doctor and as a Tai Chi practitioner for 20 years and, and former teacher. You, you are completely right. But what, what you are expecting from all of us is extremely ambitious. And you we can't do everything at the same time. So, you know, you do a clinical trial, which we explain very narrow population, one drug, very focused. That doesn't mean that everything else we think is wrong. It's just that there is so much we can do. So I don't know if it's your son sitting next to you, but we need more scientists. We need more people to finance the research because there is, there is a lot, as you could see, there are a lot of questions that are remain to be answered for FSHG. Yeah. And we just need more work and more people to uh, to do this work. It's not that we don't want to do it. It's just and sometimes it's do. not necessarily even like putting money into a trial. It's just like saying to a patient, I want you to go home. You know, you're having a lot of muscle soreness. I want you to go home and just like start taking some magnesium for a while and see how you feel. 
or like I'm not talking about things that can harm you, you know, like yeah, but so that that's where there is a there is a level of subtlety yeah. here is that yeah, you know, like as a doctor, I think one of the questions that Rabbi answer is I don't know, and it that's an honest answer. It doesn't mean it doesn't work or the work is done is bad. It's just as a doctor, I don't I don't have no, data. I understand support. that. So that, that's you know, that's yeah. what I say. We need we need more work to be done. I'm just yeah. asking as a patient that we yeah. all as much as possible come together because we're all trying to achieve the same thing. And I, I think working together, all of us like will get there faster. Well, I think Dr. Hamill said something very interesting. I took note of it. And I believe this is a direct quote because I tried to take it down word, word for word, was our approach to treatment is to get the muscle in better shape without affecting the FSH cascade, right? Yeah. 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 I said there are different approaches. You yeah. can go on the pathway or you can go on a different route and just work on the <laughs> Yes. And one of the things that is striking about the uh, benchmarks for these trials is that they haven't been compared with other lifestyle changes that could be made as part of a as part of a trial, right? Especially if that's the MO, if that's the modus operandi. All right, we're going to move on. Thank you very much. I'm coming to the community engagement piece of today's presentation. So. Um, a little bit about my story, Sandra and Michael got to share their family stories. Um, I only know about a half a dozen of you personally in the room, but um, I became involved with FSHD and FSHD Society back in the early 2000s when my husband was diagnosed with FSHD. And I really wish um, that, you know, there was a clinical team that I could have gone and seen or an online community, Heidi, that I could have gone to for support for, you know, being a caregiver of FSHD, but you know what? Today there is. And so I'm so hopeful for the future. I'm ho so hopeful for uh, anyone, unfortunately, who would get diagnosed from this point forward. But uh, my family story wasn't, um, you know, wasn't a good, it wasn't a good story because it was actually really sad. And I'm just so hopeful that um, we've got light at the end of the tunnel, which you're going to see here in a minute. Um, but um, yeah, so I've been involved with it since the early 2000s and um, our community engagement program that we have is really here to enlarge, engage, and empower a global community that's going to support our goal of getting therapies to our families faster. That's it. That's our goal. All right. So we launched our chapter program back in 2018. And um, that chapter program, that part of community engagement is really um, is a huge part of how we're going to how we're going to achieve that goal. So I just want to talk a little bit about that. Um, so why is it so important? Why is the chapter program so important? So as you've heard from pretty much everyone here today, um, in addition to accelerating research, patient community engagement is a critical, critical part to reaching the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so in 2018, we reimagined and re-engineered the FSHD Society to this one goal, which is therapies to our families by 2025. So we knew that we need to build an army of activists to advocate and participate in this goal. Everyone in this room, you are part of that army. Um, and the chapter program is really how uh, we decided we were gonna do that. So the goals for the program are threefold, to ensure that our families are empowered through education today, to build connectivity and a support among the community, like we're doing today, and to ensure that the program is not only self-sustaining, but contributes to the mission of funding treatments and a cure through fundraising. So um, that's exactly what all of our chapters are doing, one family at a time, joining together with one voice, one million strong. There's a million of us worldwide. So um, the fire inside people is like a match. The way to ignite the flame is initially through friction and then other matches are lit through warmth. So you'll kind of see that the drum beat for this year and beyond in all that we do is igniting the fire within you so that you can light the fire in others, all right? When we kicked off this program in 2018, there were several informal patient groups that kind of met on a regular basis around the country and, and Canada too, I was part of that. Um, some even cut, conducted some local fundraising events, but since then, we have grown the chapter communities by now 33, um, including three up in Canada. We've got one in um, Toronto, one in Vancouver, and one in um, Calgary. And this is all in partnership with um, FSHD Canada Foundation. So these volunteer-led chapters are leading our army of activists. They all provide our families with local hands and hearts because 
I cannot be everywhere. We cannot be everywhere, right? So it gives local hands and hearts that you can go to. It empowers our families to be their own best caregiver through education. And it gives our families somewhere to go to ensure that no one faces this disease alone, all right? Um, we would love to see an official chapter represented here in and around Rochester. So um, this is the epicenter of FSHD care here. Um, if you're interested in possibly leading uh, something here, um, it doesn't need to be a full on chapter, but um, if you're interested in gathering community here together, contact me, call me, DM me. These are the faces of the amazing volunteers that are making it happen might see a couple faces on here that you recognize. <laughs> I don't know where we got that picture, Michaela. I think it's from your Facebook page. Um, these are both chapter directors, fundraising leaders. Um, these are the people that have really stepped up to build our army of activists and lead the community and our fundraising efforts. These are the people working to build local communities all over the US and Canada. These are our volunteer superheroes. They are volunteers, you guys. They do this between the hours of midnight and six. So these, um, these are amazing people. And I just love to personalize what's going on all over the place. Mm -hmm. There's so many ways that you can get involved with community events, of course, at your level of comfort. Um, you can join chapter meetings and events either in person or virtually. Um, I said it before, one thing COVID did for us was give us uh, a virtual platform that everyone can get together. And it has just continued and it has brought people together who weren't able to get together before. Um, you can become part of our many online communities through what we call the gathering place. So um, that is includes our wellness hour, which is just anyone can come to the wellness hour and talk about you know what we were talking about today, just their experiences. And Sandra, you're a big part, I know of the well wellness hour. The care partner hour is just for care partners. Um, not for patients, it's for people who care for people with FSHD. Our early onset parent roundtable group is led by um, a, a parent um, out of Arizona. She's amazing. And she's bringing together parents all over North America, Europe, um, to talk about the issues of early onset um, and helping their own children, making sure the kids aren't left behind. Our women on wellness group, which also Sandra is a big part of, um, women only invited. The feeling fit group, which um, you know is all about exercise and self care, and then our we have a newly formed young professionals group. We had someone come to us; she was in her mid twenties, and she's like, "What about us?" And uh, so she's decided to start a group called the Young Professionals Group. So, um, and it's that's all that's invited. So these are great online communities. I would encourage there is something for everyone. Um, in one of these online communities. Um, you can come to the educational programs like this one, which is in-person and virtual, um, but we also offer online education through um, the monthly uh, FSHD university webinars, which is um, down in the bottom left corner there. Um, but we record them all and they're all on the YouTube channel. So if you missed one, who cares? Go to the YouTube channel. We've got a vast library of everything that's been recorded. We cycle through and make sure that it's still relevant and we um, archive things that are not relevant any longer. So the talk, you know, that uh, Wednesday, the Rosh folks gave, we're gonna archive that in 60 days because it's probably not <laughs> accurate anymore in 60 days. Um, you can listen to our twice monthly episodes of the FSHD radio podcast featuring our talented Mr. Tim Hollenbach. He's so great. Um, or you can participate and fundraise through the Walk and Roll to Cure FSHD or other fundraising events that are happening around the North America. Speaking of the walk and roll, we're going to be rolling out events all over the US and Canada um, for our 2023 Walk and Roll to Cure FSHD. Um, the International Celebration Day and live stream event will be held on September 23rd, um, but all local events will be happening throughout weekends in September. Um, since the walk began in 2018, these events have raised well over $3 million for groundbreaking FSHD research and programs patient and family education, and of course, support. And I believe you guys always put together a team here to walk at a park locally. So thank you guys for doing that. I appreciate that. Um, it really brings together families, friends, coworkers, businesses, all united, united together for the mission, not only of raising critical funds, but raising critical awareness. It's an awareness raising event as well. Um, and you know what, for my family and friends, when it was really hard for us to go talk to, talk to people about it, um, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to help, but the walk was a way that they could. Um, they might not have been financially capable to give a huge donation, but you know what? They could show up for us on walk day and they could help participate and tell their family and friends about it as well. So it really gives people a way to do something and contribute when perhaps they felt like there was nothing that they could do before. So stay tuned. Emails are coming out. Uh, we just started our first round of emails this past week and, um, and 
you can sign up and there's a virtual event as well. So if you don't have a walk near you, then um, you can sign up for the virtual event. All right. Ah, don't read all this, but this is basically just this month of ways to engage, to learn, to be entertained. These are all virtual events that are coming up this month. Um, so you can join from anywhere, um, but, but there are also live events happening at the same time. So be sure to come visit the website calendar, um, find something uh, that's that you're interested in and, and get involved. If you leave here with uh, just this action item checklist, I will be happy. Um, number one, be sure that we have your contact information or Robbie or the clinic has your contact information so you can receive targeted research information. Um, you can do that, of course, by going through the registry here or visit our website under the Get Involved tab and just make sure we have your current contact information. We are geotargeting um, email blasts for when we find out about a clinical study or a clinical um, trial. So it, it's important that we know your geographic location. So just city and state is really important that we know where you are geographically. Um, you can join in one of the community events that I just mentioned on the last page. Um, stay educated through FSHD University. And here today, I'm so happy that we had such a great turnout for, from all over today. Um, we have another webinar coming up on May 18th, uh, FSHD University that you might want to tune into. Um, and here's a new one, actually. Um, and this goes back to all the efforts to ensure that um, the ecosystem understands the prevalence of the disease and understands the, the, um, the burden of the disease. This code is called a G, it's called an ICD-10 diagnostic code. And it's fairly recent. I want to say it was 18 or 19 when it came out. This um, code, if, if on your record, allows research and health information systems to more accurately estimate the prevalence of FSHD and help identify patients if they're eligible for therapies when they become available. So among many other great benefits, but those are the two right now that you should know. The G71.02 code, if um, you got diagnosed 20 years ago, like my husband did, uh, it's not on his record, right? Because he refuses to go back and see the doctor. So I probably need to call him and say, please put this on his record. But it allows healthcare systems to um, understand the prevalence. And when there is a therapy, I'm not saying if, I'm saying when, they're going to call you and say, ah, oh, this code's on your record. I think this therapy might benefit you. So it's important. Cool. And that's it. Always feel free to reach out to me or anyone else on our community engagement team. Um, I'd like once again to thank our very generous sponsors of this entire conference program, Avidity and Fulcrum. Thank you, Helen, for being here today in person. And with that, I'd like to wrap up today's program. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today, both in person and online. Um, very special thank you to all our amazing guest speakers today. Um, and in Natalie, wherever you are in video land. Um, a huge thank you to our team at the University of Rochester for hosting us. Um, and the amazing planning team, I want to thank Leanne Lewis, Bailey, where did Bailey go? I think she's outside organizing things. Um, June Kinoshito is on the planning team. And of course, Dr. Ravi Tawil, thank you guys so much. Um, and now at this point, I'm, we're only 15 minutes past, but uh, you're welcome to hang out for as long as you'd like have a little social time and ask more questions of all the wonderful brains that are in this room. So thank you very much. Did we record that? Okay, good. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep up the